tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Well, hello there. This is Justin Reynolds. This episode marks my one-year anniversary with Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. The first episode that I ever recorded was aired on Halloween of 2022, Season 1, Episode 163. The story is titled, Monstrous. I certainly have come a long way since then. I would like to personally thank each and every one of you who has supported me. It's very nice to see your kind words in the comments section, and I truly appreciate you listening in. Tonight's episode is written by the gifted Mike Edwards. This story and my performance are a bit silly in this one. Well, I made it silly, but, but I still hope you enjoyed all the same. As normal with my productions, this entire episode was voiced by myself, and I also wrote and performed all of the music contained within. Now, enjoy the show, and happy Halloween, everybody. Take care. Welcome to Banville. It's a beautiful community where everyone is friendly and knows each other's name. You couldn't pick a better town to call home. Banville has all the latest outlet stores to stay in fashion, and a few trendsetters to be ahead of the curve. Why not live somewhere with the coolest cat in town is you? That's right, folks. Banville has the answer. Stop by our local jazz hall to hear the latest tunes. Some hot hit numbers to shake your pussy to. Feeling a bit warm on this lovely summer day? Stop down to Fred's Creamery to cool off and take it easy and in stride. Because you're in Banville, friends, and you deserve the best. So if you're needing a town to settle down, a space to call your place, or a flat to hang your hat, well, then you're already home. Because Banville is your town, and you know what's best. I'm Dick Stabberbush, and here's a little word from our sponsors. Hammy's Pantry. Hammy's Pantry carries the freshest produce 50 miles to the nearest town. Come on in and get your select cuts from our in-house butcher. Come smell the delicious bakery, where everything is made from scratch in the early morning hours while you're still sleeping. Hammy's Pantry. It's where everyone gets their f***ing groceries. And Aunt Clara's Feminine Soap Bars. Now available in Labia Lavender, Pussy Peach, and Country C Cranberry. Mmm, that smells good. So try the best soap money can buy. Aunt Clara's. It's the only soap I'll put on my c***. Oh, man. These old commercials of our town are just filthy with language. Gee willikers. Oh, bunch of dirty mouths. Oh, that, that must be him at the door. I'm coming. Ah, welcome. The man who stood at the open door was painfully suburban. His thick rimmed glasses were slightly too large for his face. Even with the wide grin he was currently sporting, his pastel polo shirt was tucked into the belted waistband of his cargo shorts. He was currently in his socks, but Carlos saw that the shoe rack next to the door contained two pairs of New Balance tennis shoes that appeared to be the right size. Carlos would have been surprised to have spotted any other brand. You must be Carlos, right? I'm Steven Nakoda. Come on in. We're happy to have you here. Steve Jr. is gonna be psyched to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you. Said Carlos, shifting his laptop bag in order to shake hands as he stepped inside. The front hallway was just as blandly suburban as Steven himself. Carlos felt like he was walking into an ad for a new subdivision aimed at early middle-aged couples with 2.3 children. Is he actually going to be happy to see me or is that just what you told me to get me out here? You can tell me the truth now. I'm already here and I'm not going to bail at this point. I just want to know if I'm walking into a situation with a kid who wants to learn, 
or one who doesn't. <laughs> so you really have been doing this for a long time. No, I was telling the truth. Steve Jr. loves to learn. Honestly, sometimes it's hard to get him to stop reading. He's just got an issue with staying focused on any one subject. His mother and I found that getting him a tutor is really the best way to keep him on task. He's an absolute sponge for information once something catches his attention. Okay, that sounds great. It's always good to be working with a kid who's doing his best. <laughs> no question there. He definitely is. He... I... There is one thing that I sort of downplayed. Didn't really bring it up, in fact. Steve's something of, well, older student. You said he was in high school. Was he held back? Oh, no. It's, it's just that he's not... Hmm. High school aged. He's been in something of a non-traditional schooling situation for a while. He's, well... He's in his 20s. Huh. I'm only 22 myself. Is he going to be okay having a teacher his same age? Oh, definitely that won't be a problem. Steve's had all sorts of teachers over the years. Older, young, women, men, whatever. I've just found that a lot of the tutors start to get weirded out by the idea of teaching someone their own age. Or older. I hope you don't hold against me too much. It just makes it easier getting someone out here. It's fine. I hope there isn't anything else you didn't really bring up. <laughs> I promise you, no more surprises. And Kat's going to bake you cookies to take home as an apology for the mission. She's out getting the ingredients right now. But that's hardly necessary. But I certainly appreciate the gesture. Okay, excellent. We'll have the cookies waiting for you along with the check once you're done. Uh, ready to get started? <laughs> He led the way down a well-lit hallway painted in an inoffensive shade of beige. It was decorated with half a dozen pictures of the Nakota family, smiling in various photo studios across the years. Carlos noted that Steve Jr. was no more than 10 years old in the most recent one. They turned the corner into a kitchen with four mica countertops, brightly painted cabinets, and a small wooden table placed in a breakfast nook. Wooden signs on the wall read, the quickest way to a man's heart is through his stomach. And, bless this mess, in stylized fonts. Steve Jr. is just down here in the basement, said Stephen, reaching for a door that Carlos had initially assumed led to a pantry. As soon as he opened it, the heavy strains of metal music washed into the room. Stephen winced. Sorry about that. We let him do pretty much what he likes down there. Steven! Turn it down! Tuner's here! The volume did not change. Steven smiled apologetically. <laughs> I'm sure he'll turn it off once you're down there. If you need anything, just let me know. Otherwise, I'll leave you two alone. Carlos started into the basement, closing the door behind himself. He noticed that the back of the door bore a lengthy inscription in Italian taking up most of the available space. It appeared to have been carefully hand-painted. The stairway walls were covered in sound baffling and dotted with movie posters hung in thin white frames. The first one was Inception. The next one was some 70s horror movie called Shivers, followed by a more recent one called Slither. Carlos wondered if they were connected, as the posters for both featured a horde of slugs approaching a woman in a bathtub. The next one down was Leprechaun, however, and the one after it was Doom. Carlos couldn't spot any connection between them, nor any of the next four. Equilibrium, John Wick, The Sting, and the usual suspects. The ninth poster brought him to a small landing at the bottom of the stairs. The basement, most of which was a single large room, spread out to his right. The walls were painted a deep red and lined with shelves stacked with all manner of books, tools, collectibles, and 
odd knickknacks. The shelves were held up on brackets that looked like rib bones, especially against the bloody red of the wall. A large table sat in the center of the room. An unmade bed was in the corner nearest to the stairs, while a desk bearing an elaborate computer setup sat against the far wall. An expensive gaming chair sat in the front of the desk, facing away from the stairs. The moment that Carlos entered the room, the thudding music cut off. The chair swiveled around to reveal a man dressed all in black. His thick fingers steepled before him. A patchy beard covered too much of his face. His hair was slicked back and greasy. He was definitely at least 30 years old. Well, well, well. Welcome to my lair. Carlos stood where he was, uncertain what to say. The man rose from the chair, his smile broadening into something much more natural. Portal 2? Oh, not a fan. Sorry, I haven't played the game. You're Steven, I assume. Or Steve. I'm Carlos, your statistics tutor. Call me Verbal. Steven's my dad. Okay, I'm Verbal. So you want to tell me what part of stats you're having trouble with? Are we just starting with the basics or what? First, I've got to know. Whose decorating job do you like better? Mine or my folks? Well, you've suddenly put a lot of personality into the space. Having the entire passage from the gates to hell, from Dante's Inferno on the door, certainly conveys a message. You recognized it. Well done. Did you know the whole thing? No. But seeing an Italian poem written on the door gave me some pretty good context. And that helped me recognize the last line. Still, not bad. Any chance you can name the ninth circle? Carlos set his laptop back down on the table and unzipped it. Steven had said that keeping his son on task was the hardest part. I'm really here to talk about statistics. Verbo waved his hand dismissively. <sighs> We've got hours. Let's get to know each other first. You can learn a bit about me, and then I'll learn from you. Carlos raised an eyebrow. He knew a delaying tactic when he'd heard one. Verbal offered him a pleading smile. Come on! Five minutes! One quick tour of the room, and then we'll dig into distributions, confidence intervals, and regression. All right, said Carlos. His job would be easier if he showed Verbal they were on the same side. But I'm holding you to that five minutes. I promise we'll be done within one standard deviation. It didn't precisely make sense, but Carlos appreciated the effort to make an on-topic joke. It gave him confidence that the father had been right. Verbal did want to learn the topic, and just had difficulty focusing. If a brief diversion at the beginning would help him to get into the right mindset, that would be easy enough to accommodate. Okay, give me the tour. Well... It's more of a self-guided thing. Look around. Ask me about anything in here. I'll tell you about any of it. Carlos cast his eye around the room. The first thing that caught his attention was a small framed picture of the moon with a sizable block of text superimposed over it. What's this? That's the Sapphire Memo. Read the whole thing. It's only a couple hundred words. It's the speech that was written in the case the moon landing failed. I'd love it. It's such a creepy look at what might have been. And the astronauts were still going to be alive if they had to read this one. Alive! And knowing that there were absolutely no way back to Earth. Can you imagine dying like that? A bit morbid. Every man dies. Not every man really lives. <laughs> Braveheart. I recognize that one. I used to work. Pick something else. We still got four minutes left. Mm. All right. What's this weird double bug statue? Carlos pointed to a figurine about the length of his finger. It depicted two bugs joined at the thorax, one head directly above the other. The lower bug was a translucent amber, while the upper one was green and black and opaque. Not a statue. That's a cicada midway through molting. One of the 17 year brood. It took me two weeks to kiss that one at the right moment. I painted it with a light resin to keep the other bugs out. Flies would lay their eggs in just about anything they can get to. Did you just prowl around in the forest until you found it? I tried that at first, yeah. Eventually I realized I'd be better off just catching one of the nymphs and bringing it back to where I could watch it get ready to molt. 
It still took a few tries, but it was a lot easier once I had it in a controlled and enclosed environment. Makes sense. Carlos wandered along the shelves until he found a small stack of what looked like baseball cards topped with a faded yellow checklist. These? That's the complete original series of the Garbage Peel Kids. They're from before they started putting puzzle pieces on the back. Every one of them has a permit for a different bad behavior instead. A lot of them are about lying. But they did have to come up with 41 different ones. Even Dante only managed nine. There's bound to be some overlap. Carlos thumbed through the cards briefly. They looked like a demented version of Cabbage Patch dolls, which he supposed they were a parody of. The backs were as promised. Jokey little certificates entitling the bear to various socially unacceptable behaviors. A few had names filled in in childish handwriting. One of them said Stephen. It occurred to Carlos that it likely belonged to Stephen Sr. originally. He moved on to the next item that caught his eye. A twisted white tree that looked to have been carved from rock. What's... <coughs> Carlos's question was cut off by a low plaintive cry from behind him. He spun around startled. Verbal had some sort of thin trumpet to his mouth and was blowing into the end of it producing the odd sound. What is that? Carlos asked. The lacquered instrument was as long as his forearm. It tapered to a narrow mouthpiece at one end while the other terminated into two bulges that looked suspiciously like the end of a femur. It's my king like... They're made from human leg bones. Okay, but that's a replica, right? Oh no. It's very real. Oh, sorry about that. Advertisement on the computer. Hold on, let me turn it down. He put the kingling to his lips and blew another long blast. The sound made the hairs on Carlos's neck prickle. I made it myself. He and Carlos stared at each other for a long moment before Verbal broke into a grin. Gotcha! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, real kingly and Doroth. I was just pulling your leg. <laughs> His smile widened. <laughs> Get it? He waved the bony trumpet at Carlos, who smiled weakly. Yeah, I got it. Very funny. <laughs> anyway, the five-minute tour is up. Just seemed like a fun way to let you know that. <laughs> so, stats? Oh, yeah. Stats. Carlos attempted to regain his focus. The noise from the kangling had rattled him. The way the soundproofed walls had drunk up the sound only made it eerier. He felt like the long, pleading note was still around him, hiding. Actually, do you mind if I hit the bathroom first? Verbal gestured toward a door over by the computer desk. Be my guest. The state of the bathroom made it evident that all of the things that had ever caught Verbal's interest, cleaning had not been among them. The sink was covered in soap scum scattered beard hairs, and small brown droplets of what Carlos hoped was mud. The shower in the corner was similarly uncleaned, and seemed to have molded the same color as the droplets in the sink, creeping up every corner and edge. Carlos wondered if it was possible for a sink to be moldy. He was disinclined to scratch at the small flecks to find out. His finger already felt oily from flicking the light switch on. Carlos had only asked for the bathroom in order to have a moment to collect himself. He was suddenly very glad that he had no need to use the toilet. It was closed, but the stains he could see along the edges of the bowl hinted at the horrors that might hide inside. Carlos was fairly sure that he would rather wet his pants than lift that lid. The mirror was covered in dots of toothpaste along with more of the rusty brown spots. The knobs for the sink were sticky to the touch. There was no apparent soap anywhere in the room. 
The hand towel was stained with filthy fingerprints. Carlos didn't even consider touching the bath towel lying on the bath mat in front of the shower. Eventually, he settled for rubbing his hands vigorously together under the running water, drying them off on a large wad of toilet paper, and then using that damp wad to turn the water back off. Another several squares were enough to cover the doorknobs he exited the horrific room. After using the same tissue to turn off the lights, Carlos attempted to surreptitiously toss it into the trash as he left to avoid offending his host. Verbal's back was to Carlos as he emerged from the bathroom. Have you ever heard Needle Prank? Is that the band? Oh yeah, they're the best. Absolute genius slud metal. Check out It Goes in Pink. Not the most famous song, but probably their greatest work. Music suddenly blasted the room again, a dark and sonorous beat. Guitars shrieked through the heavy distortion. Lyrics reluctantly crawled forth, though the actual words were largely lost in the sound. Now's not really the time. No time like the present. Verbal said. He turned to face Carlos. Inexplicably, he was holding a chainsaw. It was not running, but menacing nonetheless. A thousand unforeseen circumstances may interrupt you at a future time. The song still cattered walled around them. Verbal hefted the chainsaw, showing it off to Carlos. Not that this is a thousand circumstances. Maybe sixty. If you count each tooth on the chain. Still, you get the point. Carlos put his hands up slightly and forced a smile. Oh, okay, very funny. You got me. He had to shout to be heard over the music, but at least it hid the quaver in his voice. Got you. <laughs> I've done more than get you. And like that, poof, he's gone. <laughs> ah, shit. <laughs> I'm gonna rip you apart and decorate my room with your bones. Through me, you pass into the city of woke, Carlos. Through me, you pass into the city of pain. Verbal rushed forward, the chainsaw roaring before him. The sight of the whirling teeth filled Carlos's vision. He panicked, which was his undoing. If Carlos had sprinted as soon as the chainsaw sprang into action, before Verbal had both hands gripping it, he might have made it past. He could have slid across the table or scuttled underneath. Either path would have taken him to the stairs, where he could have fled into the house. Verbal's progress would have been slowed around the tight corner and narrow walls of the stairway. Carlos would have been able to make it outside to the safety of the manicured green lawns and swept clean sidewalks and happy, nosy neighbors. Instead, in that crucial first second, he froze. Verbal was already closing the distance by the time he convinced his legs to run, and by then his only place of escape was the bathroom. He ducked back inside, slamming the door, but the blade cut through the hollow core door like it wasn't even there and slashed Carlos' wrist as he attempted to lock the knob. Carlos shrieked and retreated, looking frantically for an escape. The room offered none. There was only the advancing chainsaw, and shortly thereafter a veritable geyser of blood. Steven Sr. watched the football game, the volume slightly higher than was normally necessary. He had turned it up as soon as the first strains of It Goes in Pink had made their way upstairs. The tutoring sessions always ended the same way. Once the music had hit that volume, it was only a matter of time before the screaming started. That had a way of carrying past any amount of soundproofing, and he just hated to hear it. It was a shame about the tutors, of course, but after what Steve Jr. had done to his mother, Steven Sr. had understood the dangers of letting his son go unsated for too long. Besides, 
It was good to encourage a boy's hobbies. How else could he carve a place for himself in the world? In the basement, the chainsaw snarled out an up-tempo counterpoint to the wailing metal song. Upstairs, Stephen cheered as his team Come scored a goal. Come on. All right! <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That boy in the basement's making one heck of a mess, I know it. Outside, a dog cocked its head at the Nakoda house and pulled on its leash, straining toward the basement. Its owner, his headphones in, tugged impatiently back, pulling the dog away. After a moment, it reluctantly followed. Later, while his son worked on his grisly crafts, converting his erstwhile tutor into picture frames, shelf brackets, and perhaps even a new kingling, Stephen drove Carlos's car to the scrapyard to dispose of it. The HOA had rules against overnight street parking after all. It really wouldn't do to cause any trouble. This isn't a confession. We can't prove a damn thing. So don't even try. I'll deny it to my grave. I'm on my third drink for the evening anyways. You can't trust the word of a drunken man. And that's when I start to feel anything these days. The third drink. Sometimes it takes four, but... Usually three will do. It's the same cycle every night for weeks now. I drink, then I start to feel, and the fear comes over me, and then I drink some more until I pass out. Wake up, slog through the day, keep my head down, keep my chin up, don't draw anyone's attention. Go home. Repeat. One night a few weeks back, there was a man at my door. I answered it, wondering what in the devil he was doing there at that time of night. I live in the end of my street, and there's no one around for quite a ways. Even the evangelicals that comb the neighborhood rarely make it all the way to my house. Help me, he gasped his blood-flecked lips quivering in the rain. His forearm was badly broken, bits of bone sticking through the skin. He was pale and drenched, the rain and blood dripping steadily from his haggard frame, pooling on my porch beneath him. There's been an accident. I need help, he winced. Can you help me? I nodded, dumbly, shocked at his state, then ran inside looking for my cell phone. But by the time I got back to the door with it, he was gone, the only sign of him a trail of splattered red leading down from my front steps and out into the front yard. I stood there, shocked for a moment, and then I put the phone away, slammed the door 
and locked it. I, I don't know why. I was just scared, frightened by the whole affair. And some part of me, some damned selfish part of me, kept saying, it's okay, it's someone else's problem. He's gone, forget about it. So, I poured myself a drink to ease my nerves. And then another. A few drinks later, I'd forgotten all about him. And a few drinks after that, I drunk myself to sleep. I woke up with my head throbbing. I'm not a heavy drinker. Well, used to not be one anyways. I stepped outside and noticed that there was no blood on my porch. I breathed a sigh of relief. Maybe the rain washed it all away, I thought. Or maybe it hadn't happened at all. I went to work, nursing my hangover. But I made it through the day. Came home, tried to relax. I'd slept poorly the night before, and my day took what energy I had left, so I decided early in the evening to call it a night. I was just about to go to bed when there was another knock at the door. I froze, looking over to it. My heart raced. I tried to laugh off my rising fear. It was just someone at the door, nothing to be afraid of. But as my hand reached for the knob, I heard his voice. The same quaking shudder of a voice from the night before. Help. I need help. I stood stone still as he pounded on the door. God, it hurts. He shouted. Please, why won't you help me? I put my back to the door, bracing it, squeezing my eyes shut. This isn't real, I thought. It can't be. And after a few seconds, the knocking stopped, and it was quiet. I flung open the door, but there was no one there. No trace of blood or sign of his presence. Unsettled, I shut the door locked it, and reached for a bottle. And so it went, for four more days, each night the same. The knocking, the horrible man at my door, the cries for help. help. And each night I secured the door and waited until it stopped, and then drank myself into oblivion. By the seventh night, I'd had enough. I made a stiff drink as soon as I got home, and then another after that one. I had thought of nothing but the events of the previous week that day. So naturally, I was anticipating the knocking when it came again that night, confirming my paranoid fears. I was waiting for it. I threw open the door on the first knock. And there he was, battered arm, hanging limp at his side, pale face twisted into a grimace. But before he could say anything, I leveled my shotgun at his face and pulled the trigger. His head popped like a blister, and I fired a second time, blowing his arm clean off and leaving a hole in his torso. Covered in his wet viscera, I shut the door. I want to say I was in a trance, that I was on autopilot and out of my head. But that's not true. I knew exactly what I was doing. I was trying to make a point to myself. See, I'm a level-headed man. I don't believe in ghosts or the supernatural or anything like that. We live in a rational world, 
and I damn well wasn't going to sit back and let my head play tricks on me without fighting back. They say blood is hard to wash off. That's <laughs> not true. His blood washed right off of me. One shower later, and I was good as new. So when I finished cleaning up and calming down, and went back to the front door, I likewise expected there to be nothing there, as there had been no trace of him left from the previous nights. I couldn't believe it when I opened the door, and his remains slumped inside like a sack full of meat. I reached down and poked the corpse. It was solid. The porch was covered in blood and gore. Once more I panicked, and this time I did go into sort of a trance. The hours passed in a blur as I drug the body around the back of the house, dug out a shallow grave, cleaned off the porch as best I could, and took another shower. And then I made another drink. Tomorrow the knocking would come again, I was sure. I hadn't just killed a man and buried him in my backyard. When I got home the next evening, I sat and waited anxiously. Any moment the knock would come. The man would come again, be at my door, waiting for me, asking for help. Maybe tonight I'd laugh, invite him in. Ask him if he wanted a drink, I thought, sipping my own drink nervously. The minutes stretched out, and it felt like I'd waited an eternity. When it finally came, the knocking. I breathed a sigh of relief as I rushed to the door. But it wasn't the man from the previous nights. It was the police. A car had gone off the road the night before. They wanted to know if I'd seen anyone. Maybe it was my drunken state that allowed me to lie so convincingly, but after telling them I knew nothing of it, they bid me a good evening and left. My pulse pounded in my head. This couldn't be happening, I thought. It wasn't real. The thoughts piled on one by one and all I could do to quell them was keep drinking until I lost consciousness. I called in sick the next day. I checked my backyard, and sure enough, the grave I had dug was still there, still fresh. I dug him up, burned the body until it was ash. When I was done, I went back inside the house and numbly sat down. And since then, I can't feel anything. Not until I drink. Usually three. Sometimes four. And it's only then that I start to feel it. The fear. See, I'm not afraid of ghosts. I don't believe in them. I've never believed in them. Probably in part because I was raised by my heavily superstitious mother. She made her living as a psychic, telling fortunes. She claimed that she had the sight, that she could see a person's fate before it happened and she had a steady stream of gullible clients that kept a roof over our heads and food on our table. So I didn't make a big deal out of it. But like any kid, I rebelled against her and her beliefs. And when I left home, I found plenty of support for that rebellion. Psychics aren't real, right? No one can see the future. Right? Because now I'm afraid my mother wasn't faking it. That she really could see the fate of all those people who came to her. 
And I'm afraid. I'm so terribly damn afraid. That now I can see it too. We were in high school and stupid. Jake was his name, and we liked to go out to this old abandoned house in the woods after school to just screw around, do stupid teenage things. It was a pretty big place, to be honest. Two-story house with a basement, or three stories if you count the small attic above it. The story is supposed to go that an old woman was building the house years and years ago in order to get away from city life, but, for some reason, never finished it. Probably died. Anyways, the house was pretty close to completion when she stopped, but no one bothered to finish it and now it just sits there rotting away. So Jake and I would go to the house and just screw around, scaring each other or exploring the place. Whatever we felt like. Usually we were careful, or lucky, but nothing ever happened to make us worry. Then the floorboards broke under Jake's feet when we were exploring the second floor and he fell. I never realized how bad the condition of the house must have been because when he hit the first floor, that broke too and he fell into the basement. I ran down and looked through the broken hole in the first floor. It was dark, we usually had the foresight to bring flashlights, so I shined a light on him. I'll never forget what I saw. One of the boards, or something, must have fallen at just the right angle when Jake hit the ground. It speared him right up through his stomach. I could see him shift and try and grab at it, even hear him gurgle, and then he stopped. He was dead. I was sure of it. Her stupidity got him killed. I was in shock. I didn't know what to do, so I just ran. I ran out of the house and left him there. It was about evening when I got home, and I went straight to my room. I didn't talk to anyone. Didn't stop for anything. I just wanted to curl up and try and forget that scene. My parents tried to talk to me, but I feigned sleep and they just went on. Later at night, we got a call from Jake's parents asking where he was. They actually woke me up for that one and I said I had no idea. The usual, well if you see him, please let us know, came afterwards and I, I just nodded before I went back to sleep. The next day was school and I went through the morning ritual in a bit of a trance. I didn't want to go, but I couldn't stay home. I'm pretty sure Jake's parents are expected something of me. So I went. School was just like usual. People screwing around in the morning and talking. I went up to my normal group of friends that I hung out with before the first bell rang and my heart stopped. There was Jake. He stood there, just laughing and being his normal self. When he saw me, he looked over and grinned before coming over. He made a joke, but I didn't hear it. I just continued to stare. Hey, are you okay? He asked me, starting to get concerned. Are you... Are you okay? Was all I could muster back. Well, yeah, why wouldn't I be? He laughed a bit, but gave me a weird look. You, you don't... Uh, know anything? I tried to phrase it as delicately as possible. I didn't want anyone else knowing, but I figured that was enough to clue him in. If it did, he didn't show it. Know anything of what? He responded, and then the bell rang. He said bye and gave me a weird look before heading off to class. I just stared after in shock. Why was my friend here? I saw him die! At the very least he should be in the hospital, but he was fine! I went to class, but I couldn't concentrate. I just kept thinking about Jake and how he should be dead. I kept thinking about how he could have survived, but I couldn't fill in this strange hole of a mystery. After class, I decided to check out the house. Jake met me after school and asked if I still wanted to hang out. I told him I wasn't feeling well and we'd catch up tomorrow. He seemed to accept that and move off. It's not like I wasn't excited my friends was back, but looking at him made something in me cringe. He shouldn't be alive. He should not be here. I saw him. So I went to the house that afternoon alone. When I walked in, I could feel something. It was strange but familiar. It's the same feeling I got when I looked at Jake. That something wasn't right. It was just off. However, here, it felt like a lingering feeling. Not this fresh, what the hell, I got when I saw my friend. I stepped forward and looked down. Sure enough, 
There was that damn hole he fell through! I let out a sigh in relief and bent over. So I wasn't crazy. I slipped out my usual flashlight and snowed down the hole. Yes, there was the wreck I saw land on him. Just no Jake. Did he get free? Did he magically regenerate or something? I shone my flashlight up to look at the hole in the second floor. It wasn't there. My breath got in my throat and began to frantically shine my light up to the ceiling. Where was it? I should be right under the damn hole in the floor. But nothing! I bolted up the stairs and sure enough, there was nothing in the floor where he fell. Nothing. Something was wrong. Really wrong. I wandered back down to the first hole and peeked down into it. I'm sure that was the moment that solidified my fate. If I had just ignored it, moved on, and been plain happy my friend was back, I might have been able to continue life as usual. But that's the moment. I saw something. Just a flash of something black. Blacker than the darkness beyond my flashlight's range shift and fly out of sight. I gasped and stumbled back, breathing heavily. I know I should have run, but my curiosity took hold. In my logical side, it was just some animal or trick of light. So I swallowed my fear and leaned over to peek again. I didn't see the flash of black again, but I did notice something. The boards of the wreckage underneath the hole were gone. With that note, I knew something was wrong. Nobody can clean up something like that mess in the blink of an eye. I bolted. I ran out of that house through the forest, swearing up and down something was chasing me. I had the feeling that there was something out there. But now I know it's simply watching me. For now. I ran home and slammed the door shut behind me before I leapt into my bed. My body curled up and I just lay there trying to comprehend what was going on. It took me a while, but I finally drew myself out of bed. I had to figure out what was going on, but like hell I was going back to that damn house. Not if some monster was in it. So I did what any teenager would do. I went to the internet and researched. It was slow and I didn't have a lot of luck at first. Looking up paranormal just got me weird pictures and stories. Friend comes back from the dead got me a lot of the zombie stuff. Missing time seemed to get me a little more info. A lot of it was around aliens, but a few stories seemed to pique my interest. Like, something crazy seemed to happen, like a car crash or an accident. And, and suddenly, there's a time jump and things seem to be okay. Like, nothing ever happened. There was one post on a missing time board that seemed to draw my attention, however. It was titled, Plot Holes, and it was only posted a couple days ago. I curiously clicked it. Everyone seemed to speculate what caused the whole missing time thing. A lot of the time it was aliens or dimensional whatever. This guy, however, acted like he knew for a fact, and his reason was the most bizarre of them all. He started telling a similar story. In a nutshell, his wife was killed in a household accident when part of their house caved in during a storm. While trying to get her, he was knocked out by some other debris. When he came to, he was sitting in the living room and his wife was trying to wake him up. The house was fine, with no sign of disaster, and she was alive! He was ecstatic, but described a strange feeling, like he figured out something he shouldn't have, and that his wife shouldn't be there. Like that feeling I got with Jake. Over time, he couldn't be around her. It was just too strange. So he left. He went on the road, taking what money he had and doing weird little jobs here and there while staying in motels. While he went, he began to research. It took a great amount of time, but he found others with similar experiences. Most of them just described it as a miracle and moved on with their lives. Others couldn't shake that feeling like he did. All of them described the same sort of thing. Some event should have caused something to happen person to die or some landmark to be destroyed, only to have it miraculously come back later. So what was going on? The author was at a standstill until he came across something. While researching people who shouldn't be alive, he came across a book review. Apparently, it was the latest in the series and, in it, a side character saves the day by fighting a bunch of enemies for the heroes. However, in the previous book, by a different author, that character had been killed. So this character couldn't have come back to save the day, but if he didn't, the main characters would have died. The reviewer said it was one of the worst plot holes he had ever seen. 
That got the forum author, and me, thinking. He said he'd post again after he experimented a bit, and I didn't blame him. I had a few things I wanted to experiment with as well. Nevertheless, I dropped him a message saying I read his post and that something similar happened to me, then called it a night early. I had to be extremely alert if I was going to try and look for the signs I wanted to find. The next morning, I woke up and started my first attempt at looking for a plot hole. I know how crazy that sounded, but something seemed to click after reading that review. Someone should have died, but that was ignored so he could do something of significance later. It sounded so familiar. The first few days I didn't notice anything, except that weird feeling around Jake. Nobody else seemed to have it. The third day was when I noticed my first plot hole. It was minor, the most minor of details, but it was there. One of the girls in my class went from wearing a skirt to a set of jeans between periods. I know how that seems to make me look, but I'll admit, the skirt was why I noticed. But to change into a pair of jeans within seven minutes while walking across campus to another class? That doesn't make sense. I guess it was possible, but it, it didn't make sense. It, it was like a costume got wrong during a scene change. After that, it all went downhill. I kept seeing changes everywhere. A sign would be black in the morning, but a light green later at night, or a friend would go from wearing a sweater to a t-shirt when I looked away for a moment. You think people would notice these changes, but nobody did. Maybe it was the strange feeling that I got of something being off after the accident with Jake, or perhaps you just had to be looking for them. But, as I kept looking, they were everywhere. It was about a week and a half later before I got a response back from the plot holes author. He had introduced himself as Dennis and apologized for being late to respond. His reason why? He had gotten caught up in observing plot holes. He was noticing the same thing I was. This was the first time I had actually spoken to the guy, but the changes he described matched mine to a T, except for one thing. After noticing a misspelled sign above a store late at night, he turned away for a moment to look back and saw a shadowy black figure floating by it. It was hazy, like looking at a figure through a fog that just wasn't there, but after being floated away, the spelling error was gone. A shiver went down my spine. That seemed too close to whatever I might have glimpsed at the house. I hadn't seen it fool on yet, but then now I knew what I was looking for. I wish I hadn't. It wasn't long before I began to see them. He had to look at just the right moment, I found out, when it seemed like nobody was watching or paying attention to that little error you just noticed. Then you could make it out. A shadowy haze of a being, seeming to be dressed in a long black robe with a hood, messing with it until it changed. I saw one fade my friend's t-shirt into a jacket slash shirt set on a cold day in class. And I saw another one change an entire stack of books at the library into a completely different set before they were picked up by a student. Nobody noticed them, just like the holes. It was like you had to be on that wavelength to notice. I'd been conversing with Dennis a bit online and he agreed with the idea. It seemed that you had to notice one to start seeing the others. If you could brush it off, then your life would go on. But if you were the curious sort, then you were like the two of us. You just keep seeing them all the time. You just keep seeing them all the time. I started to go crazy, 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 crazy. <laughs> I couldn't say anything to anyone, and Jake kept bothering me about why we never hung out anymore. I just couldn't look at him. He wasn't natural, but I realized but it wasn't him. It was those things that brought him back. Maybe he had some destiny or something, but I had no idea. Things took yet another turn while I was having a Skype conversation with Dennis. He asked if they noticed me yet. I told him no, and he got quiet for a long time. After some bugging, he finally responded and told me that one of his friends that was helping him look into this occurrence was gone. Nobody even seemed to remember his existence. When he went over to that friend's house, Dennis found it relatively neat save a few items strewn about. As he explored, 
the belongings that were out of place began to find themselves back into their positions. Dennis was sure it was one of those creatures behind it, and he confirmed his suspicions when he saw one putting a book back that had been thrown on the floor. And then turn and look at him. The two stared for a long time, the creature gazing onto Dennis while he looked into a blank nothingness that was its face, the dark hood covering whatever might have lurked underneath. And then it left. It turned and seemed to float right away through one of the walls. That seemed to be the last thing out of place then. The house looked like nothing had ever happened to it. Then Dennis began to notice something else. There were no pictures or objects identifying the owner. Unless you were that much of a hermit, you had, at least, an old family picture of some parents or something. Or maybe some mail with your name on it. But nothing. It was like nobody had ever lived in this fully furnished home. At that point, I began to worry. Dennis's friend had gone missing and nobody knew of his existence. I started putting the pieces together then. If these creatures could bring someone back from the dead, they could easily get rid of someone, right? This meant I was in danger. After that, I stopped. I was out. I ignored Dennis's messages. I tried to ignore all the holes I constantly noticed. I did my best to ignore those shadow creatures when I caught them. I even tried to hang out with Jake. But every time we hung out, it was like I was looking at the face of a lie, and looking at him made me think of those creatures. I imagined one pulling him up from that debris, slipping that board through and out of his body, knitting up his wounds like nothing ever happened. I did my best to look past it all. Dennis was hard to ignore, however. He kept tracking me down. I'd block him from my email and messengers, but he'd start making new accounts to talk to me to send me more messages. He seemed to be sending more and more as the days went on. Finally, one day, I received an email from a new account that clearly was Dennis. I was about to delete it and block him again, but then the subject chilled me to the bone. They're after me. Get on Skype. I need help. I didn't know what to do. If Dennis was in trouble from those things, then I had to help. I couldn't just leave him, but after him, they might turn their sights on me. I had to help. I wasn't going to leave him hanging, especially if he was in danger. I logged onto Skype, added his new account, and immediately got a video chat request. Dennis was in his apartment with the lights on, and he looked terrified. What's going on? I asked as I leaned in. They've been following me around. His voice in an exasperated whisper. More and more of them keep coming around, and not just to fill holes. They're watching me. Are you sure? In response, he lifts up his laptop and carried it out to what looked to be the kitchen. He set it down in front of a window and drew back the curtains. I couldn't make out anything until he turned on the lights. Then my heart stopped. I had only seen one of them at a time. Maybe two if something was a particularly big change. But there was at least three or four behind the window, just staring at him with those empty hooded faces. He quickly flicked off the light and turned the laptop back towards him. Do you see? I don't know what to do. I don't want to end up like Jerry. Tell me what to do! He was getting more and more anxious. I had no idea what to tell him. I didn't know what these things were. I didn't know what they wanted or how to stop them. I opened my mouth but couldn't form the words that he needed to hear. As I stammered to find out what to say, I saw them slip into the background behind him. Through a freaking wall with a cabinet. Dennis, I yelled, behind you. He turned just as the first approached. God, there were a bunch slipping in now. Three, then four, then five. He never stood a chance. The first one reached forward with an inky arm and shoved it straight through his chest. There wasn't any blood or even a sound save for Dennis's terrified scream. He began to writhe, grasping at his chest as this creature held him there by, I, I don't know what, his spine, his heart, hell it could have been his very soul for all I knew. He never stood a chance. 
Jones. The Watching Man. And then the others were on top of him. They fell onto him like a dark dog pile, consuming him in their dark presences. I couldn't scream. I couldn't look away. I just watched as he faded from view as those creatures piled onto him. Then, slowly, ever so slowly, they backed away. Dennis was gone. I bit back tears as I saw that empty space he had been in. I knew what had happened. He was gone. He raced. Nobody would even remember him. He was a hole that had to be filled in and taken care of. Then their attention turned to the computer. To me. My eyes widened as realization hit me. I was another hole. I was an issue in their grand scheme. A thorn that had to be plucked. A part that drew attention to the inaccuracies of this world they were trying to design. And I had to be taken care of. I didn't even bother to turn off the computer. I just stood and turned only to find myself face to face with a horde of them. In my own house. In my own room. My pack went back to my desk as one shadowy shape glided toward me. Its arm rose and I could almost make out the tendrils of its foggy black cloak and individual digits on its dark fingers. I couldn't move. I was frozen. And then it struck. I didn't physically feel the hand shove into my chest, but I felt it somewhere deeper, like it was grabbing an intimate part of my being. I felt violated, exposed, most of all, completely terrified. I screamed as it began to squeeze. It hurt. It hurt so much. My vision blurred, but I could see the others move around me. They filled in a circle around my body, regardless if there was something in their way or not. They just glided through like those things weren't there, and then they fell upon me. Black hit me from every side. I screamed, but no sound came out. I could feel that hand wrenching back, pulling something so personal to me away. My body felt limp, but then I started to feel nothing. It inched along my limbs, slowly turning feeling of cold, pain, terror, and absolute nothing. I could only describe it as a feeling of being erased. There was feeling, strong feeling, and then nothing. It slowly inched along, riding up along my arms and legs until it consumed my whole being. The pain faded along with it, along with the sounds of the world and my vision before me. Soon, nothing was before me but pure blackness. I was gone. I knew it. I was dead. Or worse, I didn't exist any longer. Stretched out before me was nothing but darkness. I tried to call out into the void, to claw my way forward, but I couldn't move a limb. More like, though, I didn't have a limb to move or a mouth to yell. I was just an essence, a leftover floating in the endless void of nothing. I'm still there, in the pure nothingness. I can't move, or I don't think I have anything left to move. It's gone. Every part of me is gone. I wonder what happens now. I wonder what Jake's destiny was. I also began to wonder if this was death or something worse. A punishment for sticking my nose in places it shouldn't be. This is death or pure erasure. I'm sure Dennis is feeling the same things I'm feeling. I can almost imagine him too, floating in the same void. Maybe one day we'll meet each other. It's a hope that I try to keep alive. It keeps me sane that I might, one day, not be alone here. That's the end of my story. I wish it was better. I wish I could say I fought back and saved myself. At least, that I was on the run. But some plots don't have happy endings. However, I'm sure I've left you wondering one final thing. If I'm dead, erased, then 
how have I written this? Well, my poor friend, you've just discovered your first plot hole. Be wary if you see any more. Man of the People by D.W. Gillespie Performed by Otis Gyre. Crow sat half reclined in a mechanical bed with his knees up, and a sheet draped between them like the cables of a suspension bridge. He was old, but not nearly as old as he looked. The sprigs of hair that grew in a circle around the top of his head were short and almost downy. Months ago, when his hair first began to leave him, it had been a steely mixture of salt and pepper. Now all was an unwashed white with a yellowish tinge. His skin, always a few shades darker than most, was pocked with red sores, some of which were healing, others stubbornly refusing to. A thin rubber tube looped around each ear before meeting at his nostrils. Dr. Raven, a tall Indian man, strolled in with a dour look across his usually genial face. Mr. Crow, he said with perfect measured enunciation, there are some things we need to discuss. The flat TV screen, bolted to the wall overhead, displayed the second presidential debate or maybe it was the third. Crow didn't really care, but it was the only thing on. The opponents stood across from each other, both clean-cut, both certainly reprobates of the highest caliber. So it was before me, so it'll be after me, Crow thought. Mr. Crow, Dr. Raven repeated, I've got the results back from the tests. Crow wrapped a skeletal hand around the remote and raised it. It was a bulky, clumsy thing attached to a cord connected to the bed. His bony thumb searched for the volume and he stared straight at the doctor as he notched it up as high as it would go. Then he turned his eyes back to the screen as if the doctor had never been there. Without hesitation, Dr. Raven reached up and unplugged the television. Watching that... Crow said with a voice like sandpaper. Without warning, he coughed in deep, painful bursts. Globs of blood flew into his mouth. He snatched a cup from the bedside table and spat into it. When he looked at his doctor, he still felt a small string of bloody saliva clinging to his chin. I'm afraid there is bad news. No kidding, Crow said sarcastically. The Red Sox lose? Mr. Crow, there is no easy way to say this, so I will not draw it out. We are out of options. The treatments didn't work at all, and the cancer has spread to your other lung. It is moving fast, very fast. So, what's next? The bite from his words was gone now. The doctor seemed to relax at the sound of his tired voice. Well... The conversation is no longer about treatment. Revan's voice remained calm. The conversation is now about time and comfort. There are a lot of options for... All right, Doc, let's cut the crap. How long? Dr. Raven sighed. Months, maybe less. But there are ways to improve your comfort. Oh, shut up. You damn well know there won't be anything comfortable about this. So just do me a favor and shut up. Can I call someone? Call a cab for yourself. Go back to Pakistan. Or, uh, go screw a camel on a magic carpet for all I care. Just leave me alone. The doctor stared at his patient for a few seconds and let out another sigh. He walked out of the room. Crow focused his attention back on the television for a good long time, until the urge for a cigarette grew to be unbearable. The nurse 
caught him at the elevator, dragging his IV with one hand and clutching a pack of smokes in the other. Naturally, she objected. What exactly do you think is going to happen? He stared at her with his icy blue eyes until the firm hand of his elbow pulled away. Outside, he lit up and drew in the warmth of the cigarette. It burned wonderfully, and at once he fell into a fit of coughing so fierce that he didn't know if it would ever stop. A young couple strolled by holding hands and smiling. The wife cupped the underside of her pregnant belly. When they saw Crow, their smiles vanished, and they immediately crossed to the opposite sidewalk. You've always had that effect on people, a voice said over his shoulder, though that's probably truer now than it was a few months ago. Crow turned and saw a familiar but unwelcome face moving towards him. Oh, hell, Haynes, what do you want? Come to watch me die? Nice to see you too, Crow. Vincent Hayes replied. His jet black hair lay sharply to one side. He looked as if he had just walked out of a men's catalog, matching with an air of confidence. I see that your situation hasn't dampened your enthusiasm for bad habits. Is that how you sound when you talk to your wife? Crow pulled in another drag. Honestly, I can hear you in the bedroom saying, Well, tonight, I'm feeling rather randy, my dear. Mayhaps you can fish my Johnson for my trousers for a good old-fashioned rooting. Haynes smiled a careless thing without a hint of offense. You're trying to get a raise out of me. You've always done that. I suppose dying shouldn't change anything. To answer your earlier question, no, I haven't come to watch you die. At least not exactly. After flicking the cigarette at Haynes' very expensive-looking shoes, Crow turned and headed back inside without responding. We're not done here. Actually, we are. The days of you telling me what to do are long gone. I'm here to offer you a job. Crow stopped. The light had nearly left the sky, so when he turned back, his eyes rested on Haynes' silhouette. You screwing with me? I assure you, I'm not. Crow lowered his head. Why do I get the distinct feeling you're pulling my crank for the way I treated you all these years? You got dozens of agents. No one needs an old timer with only a few weeks left on his time card. Actually, that's precisely why we need you. Your situation makes you the perfect candidate. He paused for a moment before adding... The only candidate. They stood in silence. When Crow began speaking, Haynes cut him off. There are hundreds of reasons not to do this, and I understand if you want to spend your remaining time in a more suitable manner. The truth is, he sighed as if the words inflicted physical pain, we need you. This is the biggest job any of us have ever been involved in, and We've only got one shot, one chance to get it right. Crow lit another cigarette but barely took a drag before the full body coughing overtook him. The violent heaving nearly brought him to his knees, and when he looked back up, Haynes had taken several steps back. Don't worry, Haynes, he said, wiping the blood from his chin. I won't get any lung on your shiny shoes. Crow pulled himself slowly to his feet and leaned back, struggling for air. Screw this hospital. Screw cancer. Screw you. I said I was out. He turned back toward the hospital. There's a package waiting at your house. I suggest you take a look. He'd have played a crap, Crow yelled over his shoulder, and stay away from my damn funeral. The nurse came in as he pulled his now loose jeans over his skinny backside. The alarms in the room were blipping uncontrollably as a pile of cords lay uselessly upon the bed. Mr. Crow, you need to let us know if you want to leave the room. As much as I've enjoyed my stay, I'm afraid it's time for me to go. Mr. Crow, you're no in condition to do... 
Live. Yeah, I heard as much. He continued dressing as she tried to change his mind, but it was wasted air. Things were the way they were, and although he appreciated her concern, there wasn't a thing on earth that would keep him in that room for another minute. The doctor sent him home with a portable oxygen generator, a bulky cylindrical gadget that pulled extra oxygen from the air. He realized in the car that it wasn't nearly the same as the real stuff, straight from the tap at the hospital, but it would have to do. By the time he made it to the kitchen, he collapsed into the first chair he stumbled across. He spotted the box sitting atop his kitchen table. There were no labels, no markings, nothing but cardboard and tape. It must have broken in, he thought. He briefly considered tossing it onto the floor and stomping it to pieces. The truth was, he couldn't. No matter how long he held out or how hard he fought, he wouldn't be able to die in peace until he knew what was inside. Crow drew a small folding knife from his pocket and sliced into the top. After brushing aside some crumpled newspaper, he found a gun. It was a very short, double-barreled shotgun. The type mobsters called a lupara. The entire length was 15 inches long. He thumbed the action and the barrels cracked open to reveal empty chambers. Crow closed the barrels with a flick of the wrist and the metallic crack echoed around the empty apartment. Crow dug a little deeper. He pulled out two shotgun shells, both smooth and jet black. Upon inspecting one of the copper rims, he noticed a single letter pressed into the metal. V. Crow sneered and coughed again. Setting down the two shells, he dug for the others that surely must be there. It wasn't until the newspaper circled his feet in crumpled heaps that he realized that two was all there was. The hell? Only a large plastic envelope remained. He already knew what was inside and fetched a black light. It was one of several such lamps placed throughout the house. Crow tore open the top of the envelope and slowly pulled the picture out. As always, the front showed the target. The back showed vital information, such as name and address. To his surprise, the back sat totally blank. What the hell? After turning the picture over in his hand, his mouth dropped. Crow was many things, but he was not easily shocked. He had seen more in his years than most men, but nothing could have prepared him for that. The picture showed a man in a sharply tailored suit, flanked on either side by equally dressed men of various age and race. Without a second thought, he turned on the UV lamp and held it over the photograph. The man in the center of the picture began to glow an unearthly blue. No damn way. Vincent Haynes hung on to the edge of his heated pool. It was his morning ritual. Thirty minutes in the balmy water every day of the year, weather permitting. The sun had only been up for about fifteen minutes, and the steam still rose from the blue surface, twisting in casual loops that disappeared into the cool morning air. Vincent, I'm heading out to work. All right. Lunch? Haynes asked his wife. There was a shuffling and giggling inside the house as his wife gathered her purse and their infant daughter. I, I don't think so. I'm still pretty slammed. Tomorrow, maybe? Yeah, that'll work. Love you guys. We love you, too. Haynes stepped out of the pool and began to dry off. A sudden chill ran up his back at the unmistakable cold of a gun. I didn't hear you come in, Ann said, wrapping a towel around his waist. They never do, Crow hissed in his ear. What the hell is this? Haynes turned and stared at the picture shoved into his hand. Why do you still have this? He said with a sudden sharpness. You know protocol. Screw protocol and screw you. Crow pressed the barrel to Hans' forehead. You and the agency getting one more in before I croak? Is that what this is? Hans smacked the gun aside. You planning on shooting me? You think I won't? You honestly think I have anything to lose? 
All at once, Crow began to hack and wheeze, and the gun dropped uselessly to the concrete. Neither of us have time for this, Hans said. The coughing faded, and Crow looked up, staring at his former employee with true hatred. Did you UV the picture? Of course I did, Crow replied. You faked it. Why exactly would I do something like that? You think I really have time to mess with you? You were important to the agency, but not that important. Crow flipped on the oxygen compressor slung over his shoulder and fixed the tube into his nostrils. It's a fake, he said, breathing deeply. It has to be. What's on that picture is impossible. No, not impossible. A highly unlikely worst-case scenario, but not impossible. Crow picked up the gun and flipped it open, staring at the V on the back of the shells. V-load, he said as he drew one of the shells out. I know you were more of a desk jockey, but even you know, must know what's in here. Haynes took the shell and held it out between two fingers. A dozen wood flechettes, about an inch and a half long, and each one soaked in garlic oil. Once they're packed, you fill in the rest of the shell with silver shavings. Effective kill range of about ten feet, but one of these can seriously injure a target up to thirty feet. The perfect round to kill a vampire. That's exactly why I designed it. And now you're telling me to use it on him? On one of the two men running for president? Haynes sighed. That's what I'm telling you. How the hell did this all happen? I've been killing monsters for the government for over 40 years, and I've never seen anything like this, Crow said, sitting at Haynes' dining room table. Haynes stood at the bar and poured a double scotch for each of them. I know, it's a little early for booze, he said as he swirled the dark liquor in the glass. I'll be dead in weeks, Crow croaked. Early don't mean much anymore. The picture sat on the table in front of him, and he studied it intently. I still can't imagine how this could happen. Hayes sat down across from him and sipped his drink, grimacing as he did. I've been following this for a few years now, and there are days that I don't believe it. The agency has been tracking this whole situation very closely. Trust me when I tell you that you're not the only agent involved. If you were on it, how did it get this far? I'll get there, but it goes back a lot further than you might think. Do you remember a target named Philip Knox? Crow rubbed his bristled chin for a moment. Doctor, right? That's the one. Jesus, that was probably fifteen years ago, Crow said. More like twenty. We had a lot of intel on him back then, but we never knew the full story. Based on medical records, Knox was supposed to die around 85, cancer like you. It was bad enough for him to go ahead and make final arrangements. Lucky for him, he had a sudden turnaround. Miracle drug? Crow asked, sarcastically. Yeah, you can say that. Someone turned him, but all signs point to it being a mutual arrangement. We still don't know who it was, but they wanted something from him. They wanted a doctor with a very specific interest, such as eugenics. Knox wrote half a dozen articles for medical journals on the subject. Some of it is really controversial stuff, borderline crap that can give people bad ideas. Like Hitler, Crow mused. Maybe worse, like a vampire with deep pockets. Regardless of who turned him in, he began to work closely, exclusively, for a company called Horizon Enterprises, around 1989. There, he focused on R&D, the public details of which uh, I won't bore you with. What I can tell you is how they caught the agency's attention. They were based out of San Francisco, a city with a high homeless population that began to mysteriously drop in the early 90s. Talking heads will prattle on about social systems and safety nets, but we knew better. Someone was taking them off the streets, and once we started looking, it didn't take long to trace it back to the good doctor. We? Crow asked with a bit of uncharacteristic good humor in his voice. Were you even alive then? 
Not that it matters, but I had just started with the agency around the time you took care of Knox. He glared at Crow and added, Pardon me for not being as tenured. Oh, unwind your panties and keep talking. There was enough research done into Horizon to realize that it wasn't just a cover. There were people working there, a lot of them, who probably had no clue what happened after hours, especially at the upper echelons. It was decided that taking Knox out would be enough to put the brakes on whatever was being planned, and for a while it did just that. Did you ever actually see any research? Not much, not until much later. Did you have any idea what he was up to? No, but we knew it was related to eugenics and eventually genetics. There were some notes that hinted at some kind of long-running vampire breeding plan, but they weren't complete. At the time, no one was able to put the pieces together, until three years ago, that is. Crow cleared his throat and then drained the rest of his glass. Can I smoke? Is that wise? Haynes asked. Not really, he said as he lit up. What happened three years ago? An agent killed a vampire moving a shipment of blood up from Mexico, and he found GPS coordinates to a place in West Virginia, only there was nothing for a ten-mile radius at that location. Turned out to be the start of a dirt road that led to a very remote facility in West Virginia. I'm talking off the grid completely. The outer structure was painted green to match the forest, and the majority of the floor pan uh, was buried underground. They really didn't want to be found. No kidding. We sent a crew in and raided it, and it took months to sort through the research there. Turns out that killing Knox barely put a dent into the program, but we could finally see the entire scope of things. He had identified over 30 hereditary variables specific to vampires, Everything from eye color, strength, allergies, and one very important piece of the puzzle. Aversion to sunlight. Oh, I'll be damned. Before you killed him, he discovered that certain vampires could withstand exposure to the sun for longer periods than others. And after twenty years of infecting, breeding, and even genetic manipulation, the Horizon Group had finally created their masterpiece. A vampire that is immune to sunlight. Holy hell. Well said. Haynes refilled their glasses. They could make an army and take over. That seems to be what they've always wanted. You're right. But we caught wind of everything before it got that bad. What we stumbled upon in West Virginia was still phase one. At that point, there were only three of them, all born from a single vector, a mother. He shuddered as he said the last part. Mother. All of those years of breeding and testing came down to a single focal point. An absolute abomination. Haynes paused and took another sip from his drink. I was there, and after they cleared out the fodder, they found it. No one knew what to do. They wanted a desk jockey to make the final call, so they picked me. Haynes drank down what was left in his glass and set it down on the table. Even now, it's hard to say what it was originally. They kept it in a cage, sort of hunched over like a dog. It was hairless, toothless, and eyeless. Didn't even have holes for ears. I don't even think it was actually conscious, at least not exactly. It flinched if you hit the cage, and it would lap up anything that fell on the floor, but that was it. There were tubes coming out from around its spine, removing fluids, raw genetic material. These were used to create the serum. When injected into a human, they would turn it into a vampire like no other. Based on the notes, they tested it on dozens of candidates before they got it right, and the effects were disastrous. Eventually, they cracked it, and when they did, they knew it was precious and damn hard to recreate. They had to choose the right candidate for the change. I wonder now if maybe they knew how close we were to finding them. What happened to the mother? Crow asked. V-load, decapitation, gasoline, every single shred of DNA had to be destroyed, and I made sure it was. Crow pointed to the picture. If he's one, who are the other two? Both were test subjects that worked at the facility. 
a first test and a backup. Both were killed and ID'd after we went in. They knew the little serum that remained was more precious than anything that any of them had ever done, so they made sure it went to the right person, a rising star, who had already been using his clout to further their causes, a man who wanted to be a vampire and to hold the highest office. He's the only one left. Are you sure? Crow asked, his voice rising as he finally understood the enormity of the situation. Are you absolutely sure? We confirmed everything. The Horizon Group is dead. All the loose ends have been tied and retied. The only thing left is him. Crow leaned back and took another sip before tipping his cigarette into his glass. He coughed once and wiped his mouth with the back of his sleeve. It's just one guy. What can he really do? Haynes sighed. We don't know. That's what scares the hell out of us. Maybe he can't do anything. Like most presidents, he might be too tied up in war and politics to do a thing. But imagine the possibilities. Despite everything we do, the vampire underground is stronger than ever. What if he becomes the first president to start legalizing all the drugs we supposedly fight against? The agency dwindles and they start to take over. What if he opens the borders to more traffic from Mexico? All of a sudden, we would be overwhelmed. But most importantly, what if his DNA is the key to restarting Horizon? That's what really scares me. An army of vampires walking around in the sun. Crow thought about this and said, All right, I get it, but why me? Haynes leaned back and struggled with his words. What do you want me to say? That you're one of the best? That you're the right man for the job? That you're the only one that can get it done? All of those things might be true, but I think you know the real reason it has to be. Crow's best sarcastic smile rose at the edges of his mouth. Because it's a one-way trip. Haynes nodded solemnly. I've tried to pull strings with the Secret Service to find a good time to make a hit, but it's too far gone for that. If we reach any farther, we'll expose the agency, and we can't do that, not even for this mission. If it happens, it has to happen without any extra intervention on our part. So you're asking me to commit suicide? No, I'm asking you to do what's right. Crow stood and turned toward the window. The sun shined on the perfectly manicured lawn, and he couldn't help but think about his own apartment. So shabby, so simple, so much less. You know what they gave me for my retirement? After 35 years in the case of lung cancer, I got a gold pocket watch. It's a nice one, too. He turned back to Haynes. I fought these monsters for the better part of my life, and all I have to show for it is a watch that costs about the same as your television set. What the hell do I care about what's right? Crow, please. You know what'll happen if I do this? Every person I've ever known, including my daughter, who wants nothing to do with me, will think I was sick. Not just a degenerate, but a degenerate with a diseased mind. The cops will raid my house and find all my weapons, guns, and knives... All the tools of the trade. The tools of your trade, I should say. And they'll all go, I knew something wasn't right about him. He just kept to himself a little too much. He was probably some kind of pervert, too. No, that won't happen. Oh, but it will. For months, they'll show my picture on every screen they can fit it on. So the world can see the monster. The damn monster. And then they'll go on to proclaim the real monster a hero, a martyr, a beacon of hope for all of us. And for years he will be spoken of with reverence and pride, a true paragon. I won't even be the crap on the bottom of his shoe. Does that sound just about right to you? Haynes said nothing. It's screwed up, Crow said plainly. And I wouldn't mind punching you in the mouth, but that don't mean I won't do it. I, I, I don't know what to say. I didn't propose, you dandy little jerk, and I didn't say I would do it either. I want to hear the plan first. 
I guess there's no point in arguing, Haines said as he stared into Crow's old stony face. I meant what I said earlier, when I told you we don't have much time. There's really only one shot. He'll be in Atlanta in three days for a town hall meeting. Usual fluff stuff, mainly just his supporters around to sing his praises, while the press take pictures. We've got the flight, hotel, and rental car already prepared for you. As security. For general public, not too bad, but if you want to get close, it'll be stiff. That's where you'll have to improvise. Crow stood up and slung the oxygen compressor over his shoulder. Send me the stuff. So you're in? Crow stopped at the door. Don't know. Watch the news, and if I were you, I'd work on a contingency plan. Crow spent the rest of the day drinking. Around three o'clock, someone knocked, but by the time he stumbled to the door, he only found an envelope that had been shoved underneath. The night moved on in a drunken spin. Empty beer cans littered his apartment floor like fallen leaves. Shortly after midnight, he passed out with a revolver clasped tightly in his right hand, the hammer cocked. The idea had been to get drunk one last time, but the results left something to be desired. Crow woke gasping for breath, sure he had broken some ribs at some point. He rolled onto his back and gulped at the open air, an invisible weight lying on his chest. The feeling didn't leave him until he pulled himself clumsily into his recliner and turned on his oxygen. It was the closest he had ever come to dying, and the feeling shocked him deeper than he could have imagined. He rested in the chair until almost noon. By then, his breathing had normalized. What a crappy life this is. He said as he finally groped his way into the kitchen. Good thing I'm dying. He laughed as he fished a slice of cold pizza from the fridge. By six o'clock that night, Crow had been staring at the phone for nearly two hours. She'll be home by now. I know that much. She'll be home, but he won't be yet, so now's the time. If I'm going to do it, now's the time. He lifted the phone and stared at it, something he'd done half a dozen times by now. Don't set it down again. Don't you frickin' do it. Crow forced his fingers through the numbers as fast as he could. The droning ring sent a chill down his back. Hello? A man's voice answered. Mark? Crow replied in the most amiable voice he could muster. Yes, who's this? It's, it's Mr. Crow. There was a long, empty pause. Your father-in-law. Oh, look, Elizabeth isn't here. There was a shuffling on the line, followed by the muted sounds of voices too faint to make out. She's working late tonight. I can tell her you called. Put my daughter on. I told you she's not here. And I told you to put her on the damn phone. I'm not playing with you, you prissy little twerp. I swear to God, if I have to drive down there, I'll beat you until you're... Dad! It was the first time in three years that Crow had heard his daughter's voice, and his eyes immediately stung. Liz, he said in a shaky voice. I, uh, hi. Dad, I thought we agreed you wouldn't do this anymore. Her voice was stern. I know, it's just that, well, there's some things going on with me and I needed to let you know. There's nothing you can say now that can make up for the things you said when Mark and I got married. I don't expect you to change your mind, Liz. I just need to tell you something. No one calls me Liz anymore. No one has called me that in ten years. Crow paused for a long time. You're still Liz to me. Her answer was sudden, direct, without a moment of hesitation. I don't want to hear from you anymore. Not now. Not ever. The phone went dead and he sat in the fading sunlight spilling in through the bedroom window, feeling more empty and older than he ever had. When the sun was gone, he found a forgotten fifth of bourbon in the back of a kitchen cabinet. The bottle was half full, and he belted it down within minutes. At some point in the night, Crow found himself behind the wheel. It played like a VHS tape that had started in the middle. 
He couldn't, for the life of him, remember getting in the car or turning out onto the highway. Could have been killed, he thought to himself, and the idea made him double over with laughter. Crow knew exactly where he was headed, and there was only one reason for going there. He stopped the first hooker he crossed, something he never did in the past. But now, diseases didn't seem too pressing of an issue. She stepped into his truck, and they drove. What you looking for? she asked. You got a menu? he replied, laughing. They passed under a streetlight as he glanced over at her, seeing a glimpse of her for the first time. To his amazement, she was smiling, a toothy, decaying smile. You a case, ain't you? she replied with good humor. That I am, sweetheart. I know a place up here. She said, motioning to an empty, darkened lot. Once in the parking lot, she turned to him. So, uh, let's talk business, she quoted the prices and services, ticking them off with her fingers. Crow leaned back and smiled. Hmm, he said with a smirk. Might just have to go with a sampler platter. He reached into the glove box for a roll of cash. Money is no object, my body lass. A sudden splash of moonlight hit her face and Crow felt silent. Without any real warning, he was thrown backward. Back through the pain and the years of the soul-crushing regret. All at once, it wasn't a stringy-haired hooker in the passenger seat next to him. It was his wife. Maybe it was the way the moon hit her face, or maybe it was the faint scent that hung on her. The subtle smell of perfume or deodorant. A scent that was achingly familiar. Or maybe he was just a dying old man whose mind refused to be trusted. The reasons didn't matter. Here, he said, handing her money. She thumbed through the stack, and when she realized they were all hundreds, her eyes cut back to him defensively. Now, I don't do no crazy stuff. I got kids. Please don't make me do no crazy stuff. Just get out, he said. Her eyes grew large, and tears welled up at the edge of him. Don't kill me, please, don't kill me. Crow reached across her and opened the door. I'm certainly a piece of crap, lady, just not that kind. As the prostitute fled into the night, Crow drove away slowly, stopping just once at the liquor store. The next morning, Crow's pillow was dark brown from blood. He stared at it, wondering how much he'd lost, and when he stumbled into the bathroom, he wasn't surprised to see the sallow, sunken shade of his skin. He looked dead already, and the way things were going, he would be by the end of the week. There was nothing left for him, not that there had been much to begin with. It took a few hours to gather his supplies and load his trunk with his tools. By nightfall, he was in Atlanta. When Crow checked into a hotel... He sent a suit out to be cleaned with the guarantee that it would be ready first thing in the morning. He hated wearing suits, but this one was sharp. It was a single-breasted navy blue job that made him look as respectable as any other man at the town hall. Crow spent most of the night in his hotel room with his tools spread out on the table. He brought a bag packed to the brim with everything he could possibly need, and he immediately set to work. For years, he had been good with his hands, and even though they shook harder than ever, they refused to let him down. The only break he allowed himself was long enough to order a steak, the biggest one that room service could bring. In the early hours of the morning, when the work was done, Crow wondered whether or not the thing he built would get the job done. Either way, he said to himself, either way. Crow checked his reflection in the mirror barely recognized himself. His face was clean-shaven for the first time in a month, and though his suit was as sharp as ever, it clung to his old bones like they were draped over a coat rack. It was the thinnest he had ever been. The last thing he did was pull out a notepad, removed a square of the white paper, and sat down on the edge of the bed. It didn't take long to write what he wanted to say. Let's do it he said as he slung the oxygen tank over his shoulder. After tipping the cab driver a hundred, he stepped out at the convention center. Damn buddy, the driver said. Thanks, I hope you get to feeling better. 
Crow laughed. You know something? Dying is damn tough. The walk up to the center almost did him in. He was forced to stop in the long flight of concrete stairs to fit the oxygen tubes into his nostrils. The crowd parted around Crow. Some glanced, feigning concern. But no one tried to stop him as he made his way through the sea of people. Once he made it into the center, Crow truly believed he would keel over then and there. With each new breath, his lungs expanded a little less. It felt as if his shirt grew tighter by the second. He leaned against the wall, coughing and wheezing, completely unable to catch his breath. Finally, one of the staff spied him and approached cautiously. Sir, are you all right? Crow dug deep and spoke. No, sir, I'm not all right. He took a deep breath and tapped into his few remaining reserves of charm and hoped it would be enough. And I won't be all right until I know our country is headed in the right direction. I'm sick, awful sick. But I've come to see the man that could save the country I love while it's still worth saving. And if I get the chance to shake his hand, well, sir, I think I could die happy. The growing smile on the young volunteer's face told Crow that even at death's door, he still had it. The volunteer led him into a queue of people, all passing through a strenuous security check. After a short wait, Crow was asked some personal information, which an attractive young girl entered into a laptop. There was a short pause as the computer ran his information. Then she gave a quick smile and allowed him to proceed. In the past, before computers became quite so ubiquitous, he would have been worried, but not anymore. The agency wasn't good for much, but you could count on them to cover the fake IDs. Thanks for coming, Mr. Jacobson. It'll take a minute to get through security, but after that, we'll have a seat for you near the front. Thank you, my dear. Crow smiled kindly. That's right, he thought. Just another old grandpa here. Nothing to worry about. He counted a dozen security men, all in dark suits and wearing sunglasses, except for a single dark-haired young man holding a wand. As Crow walked through the gate, the alarm began beeping. Oh, my, he said. I suppose it must be my belt. Raise your arms, the guard said. Crow did as instructed. The guard swept the wand up and down. He settled briefly on the oxygen condenser before lowering the wand, apparently satisfied. Each breath was so shallow that Crow was seeing black blotches in front of his eyes before he sat down in his assigned seat. It was the front row, just off center of the action. As he eased down, his vision began to clear. Sir, are you okay? He nodded at the boy. Fine. Just need to catch my breath. Crow leaned on his elbow and focused on breathing until a spasm of coughing assaulted his momentary calm. The handkerchief he kept in his pocket was soaked with blood by the time it stopped, but he quickly stuffed it away. A sudden blur of movement and deafening applause added to the overwhelming confusion Crow felt. Then excited voices coming through the speakers blended with cheers from places unseen. Here he is, our next president of the United States, a true man of the people. There were splashes of color that darted in and out of the gray arena, and a voice louder than the others rose above the din. Crow tried to keep his focus, but so much was happening at once. He let himself fade into his memories. Liz, he muttered. Something black stirred around the rafters, and occasionally a smoky tendril stretched down and brushed across the audience like a hand drawn across the tops of a wheat field. Crow rubbed his eyes, and it was gone. Suddenly, there was a hand on his shoulder. He was being lifted up, helped to his feet, and even in that stupor, he managed to smile. Do you want to talk? The usher asked. Crow's eyes focused just long enough to see the same young man that greeted him at the front door. I think we would all love to hear from you. Crow had never been more confused in his life, but then a euphoric moment of lucidity washed over him. The sights and sounds melted away, and there was only him and the job. In 35 years, he had not missed a target. 
He stood up as straight as his aching insides would allow. The usher led him down a few stairs to the empty microphone waiting at the bottom. A woman in her fifties had just finished asking a question, and the candidate was just now wrapping up with his winding answer. You'll be next, a man told Crow. Just step up to the mic and share your thoughts. It'll be positive, right? Crow flashed his slyest smile. Absolutely. The crowds clapped, thousands of faces turned toward him, and everything fell silent. This is it, Crow thought. Did you have a question, sir? The candidate, the enemy, the catalyst that could change the world, asked him. No, Crow said, suddenly aware of how weak his voice sounded. Not a question, just a statement, if you'd listen. Of course, I'll always listen to the American people. I knew you would. Crow took a deep breath and tugged uneasily at the tube in his nose. I've been a public servant for thirty-five years. I've worked hard almost every day of my life. And I've sacrificed a lot to do my job well. It was a job that a lot of people wouldn't have wanted to do, but I tried not to complain too much. He took a breath, then continued. Now I'm sick. I don't have much more time. Here, at the end, I can't help but wonder what all that work was for. I've always thought that we go out what we put in, that the world we fought for was the world we found waiting for us. He stopped to breathe once more. But that promise didn't come true, not for me at least. I'm at the end and I don't have much of anything. He scanned the room for a moment, realizing he didn't have much else to say but knowing that his work wasn't done, not just yet. But I have to say one thing. Before I die, I want to know that the America I grew up believing in will be in good hands. I want it to be like it was, and I know you're the man to get us there. I don't have much left to believe in, but I can honestly say that I believe in you. The crowd erupted, and the candidate nodded his head, smiling all the while. When the applause died, he followed up with a mini-speech of his own, thanking Crow for his contribution and assuring him that his work and hope would not be in vain. The usher took Crow's shoulder once more and led him back to his seat. That was amazing, the young man whispered in his ear. I'll bet you make the national news. I'd put money on it, Crow snorted. The people around him were still clapping, still bobbing their nods of approval as he took his seat among them. A hand gently settled on his shoulder and he glanced back to see a white-haired man leaning in close to him. Jesus is with you, brother, the man said. Crow stared from the hand up to the man's eyes. Get that hand off me before I shove it up your backside. The hand slowly slid away. Time passed. Crow faded in and out, hardly there. Then he was on his feet, pushed forward by the throng, urged up to the edge of the crowd. The candidate was passing by the aisle, shaking hands, smiling for cameras. Crow tottered, barely standing, barely breathing, barely living. The world was a tapestry of voices and faces, most unfamiliar, but some long lost, long dead, long gone. Still he was urged forward, closer and closer, until he was next in line, so close to the candidate, he could smell his aftershave. A hand thrusted towards him, as welcoming and warm as any old friend. Crow looked from it to the beaming face of the candidate, no doubt pondering the mileage the picture could generate. Crow had slaughtered hundreds of beasts before, but never had he shaken hands with one. He slapped his hand into the candidate's and shook firmly. Then he pulled him close, so close, his mouth was inches away from his ear. The million-dollar smile never faded, and they looked like two old buddies sharing a joke. The oxygen condenser lodged in between the two of them, and the top pressed into the candidate's chest. Crow slipped aside the false bottom from the casing he had hollowed out 
the night before. He drew his target closer with his right hand. With his left hand, he found the handle of the double barrel resting in the tank. He pressed it up toward the top of the condenser. You know what's funny? He asked the creature in front of him. There are fools in this world who actually think their lives make a difference. The candidate pulled back, his smile fading as the two men parted. Crow tilted the condenser down toward the vampire's heart. Can you believe that? He asked, grinning as he pulled both triggers. The back of the candidate's immaculate suit exploded into confetti, and blood splattered onto everyone within a ten-foot radius. Splintered wood and shaved pieces of silver shredded the vampire's heart, and the candidate was dead before he hit the ground. Secret Service agents were on Crow, but none of them opened fire like he thought they would. Instead, they dove on him, pinning him on the ground. He felt knees all over his back, elbows across his neck. Rather than fight, Crow simply closed his eyes. Let's get this over with, he thought. In normal cases, there might have been questions of police brutality. Crow's, however, was no normal case and there was little doubt that the severity of his cancer had contributed greatly to his death by asphyxiation under half a dozen Secret Service agents. Even without the cancer, no one would have shed a tear for him. Crow became the kind of freak that the world couldn't get enough of, a man that hated God and country, a total anarchist whose story could only end in such a brutal way. Anyone close to him was hounded by the media for months after the assassination. The candidate became a firebrand for the country, a symbol of true patriotism. Bridges between the two parties were mended as every elected representative united in hatred of the man named Crow. In the end, every detail of that sad slice of American history was accounted for, catalogued, and drawn out to its absolute extreme. Every detail except for one. After Crow had left his hotel room, an employee of the agency had entered at Haines' request. He had removed a note handwritten on a piece of hotel letterhead. The note had been delivered to Haines, who had instructed it to be delivered to the home of Elizabeth Wilcox, formerly Elizabeth Crow. The note read, Liz... I could never convince you or anyone else, but what I did was the right thing to do. That doesn't matter, though. I just wanted you to know. I'm sorry. Crow. I pulled into the bar parking lot and stopped the car. I sat there for a moment, letting the engine idle as I thought about what I was doing. I knew my wife and kids were at home waiting for me, but I couldn't bear to face them right now. The thought of spending another evening with them while avoiding the elephant in the room made me physically sick. I closed my eyes and cursed myself. Everything was going to shit. My wife was pregnant with our fourth child, and I simply wasn't making enough money to support us. Over the past six months, our quality of life has slowly declined was becoming harder and harder to explain to the kids what was happening. My wife and I loved each other, but the financial difficulties sprouted endless arguments that could last late into the night. In truth, I was scared. I, I didn't know how to pull my family out of this terrifying nosedive. I started having trouble sleeping, and my mood worsened. I'd find myself snapping at the kids over little things. So instead of taking out my anger and frustration at my family... I started to drink after work. At first, it was just a beer or two, something to take the edge off. But after a month, I began to stay later and later, drinking more and more. It was time I needed to think. It was a few moments of peace. My wife hated my habit. I didn't blame her. She, she never argued with me about it, but when I came home reeking of beer and whiskey, she got that look in her eye that look that said everything. I never really was a drinking man before I fell on hard times. Even in college, I never drank much. 
Certainly never to the point of being seriously drunk. I just didn't see the point. But now that my life was crumbling before my eyes, I found comfort in it. I, it was a space I could enter and push my thoughts to the edge of my tired mind. And tonight, I needed a drink. Before leaving work, my boss told me that they were conducting layoffs in the coming weeks. He didn't go into details, but as I sat in my car, I realized he was unofficially informing me that I would soon be jobless. I felt sick. I, the hell was I going to do? How was I going to provide for my family? Growing up, I never expected this. Why would I? The thought of my kids made me terribly depressed. I mean, they depended on me. They looked up to me. How, how was I supposed to tell them that their father was a failure? How was I supposed to tell them that daddy couldn't pay the bills? I pulled my car door open and forced my mind to settle. I licked my lips. I almost ran into the bar. Music droned somewhere above me as my eyes roamed around the room. Neon beer signs lined the walls and their colors trailed in the air as I sipped my sixth rum and coke. My head was floating above my shoulders and the conversation around me slurred and streaked like wet paint. I licked my lips and it felt bloated on my face. I blinked lazily and realized I was breathing heavily. I shifted on my bar stool and almost fell off. My mind exploded with dizziness and my stomach churned uncomfortably. How many beers that I had before starting the endless rum and cokes, I couldn't remember. The bar was surprisingly full, but I couldn't focus on an individual face. They piled around me, trying to get in drink orders, and I felt like a rock sticking out in the middle of a moving stream. I raised my glass to my lips and drained the last of its contents. Hey, Jack, you should go home, buddy. The bartender said, leaning in towards me out of the pool of mixing colors. Um, maybe, maybe one more. Man, I'll head out, I mumbled, raising my head to meet his gaze. His face swam before me, and I closed one eye to stop from moving. I think you're done, buddy. Come on, go on to your family. I could feel darkness swirling around the edge of my vision. I snorted, and the bartender shook his head. Want me to call you a cab, Jack? Uh, for some reason, I found this incredibly offensive. I shook my head violently. Now piss off, I'll be fine. My head felt like a bloated boulder. I dug into my pocket and pulled out a wad of crumpled cash, threw it on the bar and stumbled towards the door. I felt like I was walking through a movie scene I wasn't supposed to be in. People turned to stare at me. I heard mutterings and snickers directed at my intoxicated state. I was too drunk to register shame and I shoved some punk kid aside and pushed my way out the front door. The world rocked beneath my feet and I felt a sudden urge to vomit. I exhaled slowly and dragged my feet towards my car. I was in no state to drive. I gripped my teeth and checked my watch. It was after ten. Shit. I banged into my car, still looking at my watch, and let out an angry grunt. I ran my hands over the door until I found the handle and pulled it open. I didn't dare look at my phone and see how many missed calls I'd had. I sighed and climbed into the driver's seat. I needed to rest for a moment, settle my head, then I'd drive home, apologize to my wife, and I'd tell her about the inevitable layoffs. But first, I needed to sleep. I closed my eyes, and darkness rushed me. Hey there, Slick. I pulled my eyes open. Blinding sunlight immediately forced them shut again. I rubbed my face. Trying to clear my mind, to my surprise, I felt alright. In fact, I felt fantastic. I opened my eyes again, and cheery sunbeams warmed my face. I blinked. I was sitting in a sprawling green meadow. Birds chirped overhead. Green grass rustled beneath me. A pleasant breeze chuckling through the air. I was sitting against a tree in a circular clearing with a swaying forest that wrapped around a sparkling pond. Lily pads spotted the crystal surface like green paint on an artist's palette. It was breathtaking. For the first time in months, I felt peace settle in around me. The blue sky overhead was cloudless and I closed my eyes, raised my face to absorb the gentle sunlight. Beautiful, ain't it? I snapped out of my trance and shot a look over to my left where the sudden voice had come from. There was a man sitting against a tree, not 
five feet from where I sat. He was in his mid-forties, wearing a tan suit. A silver watch glittered on his wrist, and his sports jacket wrinkled against the bark. His green eyes sparkled underneath the brim of a baseball cap that was pulled low. Where am I? I finally asked. The last thing I remember was passing out in my car, drunk off my ass. The man smiled to reveal perfect teeth. Ah, don't worry about that. Might no use in it. Just relax and enjoy all of it. His slight southern accent added to the pleasing atmosphere, and unexpectedly found myself comfortable around this stranger. Um, my wife, I, I need to get back to her and my kids, I said without much conviction. It was just so impossibly gorgeous here. I, I knew I needed to get home, but the overwhelming calm I felt made it hard to put action behind my words. I ain't going nowhere, Slick, the man said closing his eyes and taking a deep breath through his nose. Just take a load off. Enjoy yourself. Bewildered, I leaned back against my tree, ran my hands through the blades of grass. The woods filled my head with earthy scent, a combination of dirt and fresh rain on wood. The pond before me glittered like a mirror filled with diamonds. I found myself smiling. Whatever this place was, I never wanted to leave. All my worries seemed so trivial here. The overbearing stress I had felt earlier was gone, leaving in its place a warm, comforting feeling, almost like happy nostalgia. I'm Russ, by the way, the man said suddenly from his spot. I turned and saw his eyes were still closed, but a small smile lined his lips. I'm Jack, I answered, watching a silverfish jump from the surface of the pond and snatch a bug. The man, Russ, chuckled. <laughs> oh, I know who you are, Slick. I cocked my head at him. Uh, who, who are you? What is this place? Russ adjusted the ball cap on his head before answering me. I just told you. I'm Russ. And this... He spread his hands. This is just a little slice of peace, buddy. Ain't nothing more. I asked after some time. Russ snorted, but there was no malice in it. <laughs> For eating up, partner. That wouldn't be good. This place isn't meant for that. Not anymore. I raised an eyebrow. Not anymore. Before he could answer, a noise echoed in the forest around us. It was distant and low, a single deep note that crawled up the sky and fell upon us. It sounded like the beat of a great drum. Russ pulled his cap up and sat a little straighter. What was that? I asked as the sound faded. Russ looked at me, his eyes uneasy. That's why you can't stay here for very long. Suddenly, the drums sounded again and again and again, a constant beat that filled the woods with a single ominous note, and for some reason, it filled me with a creeping dread. <laughs> Russ mumbled under his breath. What is it? I stressed, feeling uneasy. Russ stood up, brushing himself off. That's the whistling man. Oh, he's bad news, Slick. You don't want to be around if he shows up. I wasn't following anything he said, and it must have shown on my face because he raised his hands. Listen, you need to leave, he said as the drums slowly began to grow louder. W why? What will happen? I asked. Russ waved me off. Nothing good, Slick. I'll tell you that much. You can come back, but not when he's around. But where is here? I sputtered as Russ advanced on me. Before he could answer, the forest filled with a piercing cry, a sharp whistle that cut through the sky and echoed all around us. I slammed my hands over my ears as the deafening note danced across the sun rays and exploded across the meadow. As the wavering echo faded, another whistle followed, this time lower, a kind of haunting melody that chilled me instantly. 
The drum was growing louder. I thought I felt the earth shiver slightly beneath my feet. Russ turned to me, his eyes wide. Get out of here. Go. He shoved me backwards and I stumbled, tripping over my feet. I woke up, gasping in my car. I immediately opened the door and vomited into the parking lot. A great gush of hot stomach acid and gurgling rum. Tears leaked from my bloodshot eyes as I sat up and wiped my mouth. My head was splitting and I was desperately thirsty. I looked at my watch and groaned. It was a little after midnight. I took a few seconds to collect myself. Thinking back on what happened and what I just experienced. What had just happened? I could still hear the echoing shrill note, the chilling whistle. Or did I? I, I, I ran my hands over my face, the, the consequences of my nighttime drinking churning my stomach again. How was I going to explain this to my family? I, what was I going to tell my wife? She was going to be furious. I suddenly wished I was back in the meadow. The serene peace that it offered upon arrival was intoxicating. No worries, no stress, no responsibilities, just warm, beautiful, accepting nature. As I stared at my car, I made a mental decision. I would do anything to go back. Now, I thought I knew how to get there. The next two days were waking hell. As I expected, and rightfully so, my wife was pissed. She wasn't a woman who yelled or threw things. I almost wish she was. Instead, she turned to ice, barely acknowledging my existence until my due sentence was up, whenever that was. I tried to be... Extra active with the kids. Even taking them out for ice cream. But that wasn't enough for my dear wife to warm to me. It was the weekend, and every minute seemed like a chore. On the outside, I was super dead. Making sure to always wear a smile and engage my kids in conversation and playful fun. None of this thawed my wife out, and I felt the thirst return to me with a vengeance. I still hadn't told her about the inevitable layoffs, and judging by her mood, I wouldn't until until her fury had passed. Night rolled around. She still wasn't talking to me. I decided after work the following day, I'd return to the bar and get shit fist again. I needed to see if I could go back to that meadow. I needed it in the worst kind of way, my sanctuary of peace. I knew it was the worst thing I could do. But the frustrations of the weekend pushed the logic out of my frazzled mind. She didn't fully understand the stress and worry I was going through. She didn't know the weight I carried every day. It wasn't her fault. But I expected her to cut me some slack. My wife silently turned her back to me. I licked my lips, focused on tomorrow. The need was so great. I almost got up and left right there and then. What little reason I still possessed forced my eyes closed instead. I tried to summon the vision of the meadow. I could almost feel it, waiting for me right behind my eyes. If I focused hard enough, I thought I could smell the greenery swirling through the swaying forest. If I shut everything out, I thought I could hear the frogs croaking at the edge of the waters. Was that Russ? I, I was sure I had just heard him speaking to me. His southern accent melting the air, like warm butter or steamed corn. But it was all just out of reach. For whatever reason, I couldn't quite access that special place. I needed a catalyst. I needed a goddamn drink. And that's how I found myself slumped over the bar the following night. The day had seemed like an eternity, the clock indifferent to my desperation. On the way to work that morning, I almost stopped at the liquor store, but managed to hold off. My boss didn't say anything to me, which I took as a good sign, and I diligently plowed through the day's duties. My wife still wasn't talking to me, barely looking my way as she prepared the kids for school. I had tried to give her a hug goodbye, and she brushed me off, muttering that she had to finish packing lunches. This sparked an anger in me, and... I wordlessly left the house, clamping my teeth shut so I wouldn't say anything stupid. I knew getting wasted tonight wasn't going to repair our teetering marriage, but I'd been pushed to my limit, 
If she wasn't going to forgive me, then what was the point? Her morning coldness had her morning coldness had cemented my resolve to go out tonight, and I barely felt any guilt. I justified it in my mind, with little effort, as I pulled into the bar parking lot. I felt a cold blanket of relief sweep over me. This is where I could let go a little. This was where I didn't have to think about my problems. I tipped the glass to my lips and sucked the rum off the ice cubes. I hadn't bothered mixing my drinks that night. I had a destination in mind, and I wanted to get back there as soon as possible. Judging by the way the room swam, I was doing a pretty good job of it, too. The bar was relatively empty, and I was relieved for that. A quiet tune played from the retro jukebox in the corner, and I hummed along as I tapped the bar for another refill. The usual bartender was off tonight, Kenny, and I was grateful for it. He had a tendency to cut me off, and I didn't want that tonight. I smiled at the young lady, my drink server for the evening. I was trying my best to maintain my composure, and the lack of people helped my cause. I downed half the rum in one swig and felt it slam into my stomach like a derailed train. I burped behind my hand and felt my eyelids flutter as if they were suddenly swollen. I smacked the taste from my lips and my tongue burned with alcohol. My thoughts had become hard to control, the booze filling my mind like a sinking ship. I had been here for three hours. I felt like if I had tried to stand, there was no guarantee my legs would obey. I tipped the glass to my lips one last time. And that was enough to cloud my vision with a heavy fog. Blackness pressed in on my sloshed brain, and I ran a hand over my face. I felt like it felt like there was a face over my face. I giggled at the thought, but was suddenly overcome with sadness. I blinked a few times, and decided it was time. I cashed out with a mumbled thanks to the bartender, and very carefully walked out to my car. The world rocked beneath my feet and the full moon was so bright I had to shut one eye against it. My head felt thick and every breath tasted like ice and spiced rum. I stumbled to my car and managed to get the car door open before collapsing into the driver's seat. I rolled my head back and shut my eyes, a small smile on my lips. And I waited for it to happen. It didn't take long. I opened my eyes. Gentle sunlight lit my vision. Stunning greens and blues melted together to form breathtaking beauty. My senses filled with the peaceful and now familiar meadow before me. I was back. The dense forest encircling this pocket of paradise swayed gently in the breeze, the leaves rustling together to form a serene soundtrack to the majesty of this hidden nature. The grass was soft beneath me, like cool blades of emerald silk. I ran my hands through it and leaned comfortably against the tree I sat under. The pond before me was captivating in its stillness, a plate of shining silver. I turned and saw Russ, sitting a few trees over, his blue baseball cap resting high on his head. His tan suit jacket was bald behind his head, and he leaned comfortably against it. I... I had to come back, I said. This place. I trailed off, trying to find the words. That's something special, ain't it? Russ grinned, crossing his feet in front of him. You got that right. Silence passed between us, and I sighed heavily, a smile filling my lips. My head emptied of worries and was filled with complete tranquility. The secluded isolation added to the calming magic of the meadow, and pleasant birdsong danced between the trees. Again, I was filled with the desire to never leave this place. Everything was just so perfect. It made my life seem unfair in comparison. Why were things so hard? Why did misfortune and approaching despair plague my every day? Why couldn't I just stay here, away from all that? and closed my eyes in this peace. This was all I needed. You know, Russ said from his spot, as much as I enjoy your company, I don't worry about you. I snorted and looked over at him. 
Oh yeah? Why is that? Russ adjusted his baseball cap. You know why. Don't make me say it, Slick. Can you just let me enjoy the quiet? I asked, shutting my eyes. Russ grinned. Of course, pal. Of course. But I need you to know something. Before he could continue, a distant drum began to beat. Boom. 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 I opened my eyes. Russ pointed out into the woods, towards the noise. That. I shifted, trying to block out the sound. It twisted my stomach with unease. What about it? I asked softly. Russ stared at me, under the brim of his cap. That name used to be here. I nodded towards the distant drum. That? The drum? His green eyes bore into my skull. Not just the drum. Him. I licked my lips. Who? Russ's voice dropped to a whisper. The whistler man. You can tell when he's around when the drum barks. He's looking for you, Slick. He never don't stop. I shifted uncomfortably. Who is he? What does he want? Russ stared out into the forest. You really have to ask. I suddenly threw my hands up in frustration. What are you talking about? Before he could respond, the air filled with a shrieking note. A long, high whistle that bore into my head like a screaming drill. Swarms of birds erupted from the trees and took flight. Escaping the sound, Russ jumped to his feet, fear written across his face. You better scram, Slick. This sounds like he's close. I don't want to, I shouted, climbing to my feet. I don't care who he is. I I don't care what he wants. Anything is better than going back to... Out there, I finished, jabbing my finger towards the sky. Russ approached me as the drumbeat grew louder, another whistle slicing through the metal like a razor blade. It was the same note as last time. The thought of leaving made me want to weep. I'd only just arrived. I couldn't leave yet. I couldn't face what awaited me on the other side. He doesn't have to be here, Russ said urgently, shooting a look over his shoulder. You have to get rid of him. It wasn't always like this. What the fuck are you talking about? I cried. The drum was deafening at this point. I felt the soil beneath my feet begin to tremble. Russ opened his mouth to speak, but a new voice erupted from inside the forest. A horrible, deep bellow of rage. Jackie! Where are you, Jackie? Russ's eyes went wide, and the blood drained from his face. He took a step forward and raised his hands to me. Go! Go! He shoved me hard, and I went sprawling backwards. And woke up with a jolt inside my car. Nausea tossed my stomach like a rotten salad. I slammed the door open and emptied my gut into the asphalt. No! I screamed, wiping my face and pounding the steering wheel. No, no, no. I can't be here. Let me go back. The horror of being back in this waking world, faced once again with my looming, life-ruining problems, filled me with absolute panic. The night air filled with indifferent moonlight. I raised my eyes to the sky. I can't do this anymore. Russ, let me come back. I thought I could feel his presence. A tickle in the back of my head. I focused on it, begging to be swept away to the calming meadow. I didn't care about the whistling man. I didn't care about what he wanted. I couldn't face my family right now. I didn't want to think about work or money. I just wanted to go back. Help me! I cried, slamming my fists into the dashboard. Take me back! I sat there for a moment, trembling bloodshot eyes, catching focus on everything, then nothing. I wiped my face. You can't do this to me, I muttered. You can't make me stay here. I checked my watch and saw that it was midnight. 
Last call wasn't for another hour and a half. I licked my lips and ran a hand through my hair. I felt like shit. I knew I probably looked like shit too, but that wasn't going to stop me. I'm coming back, I growled. Stepping out of my car, avoiding the puddle of vomit. I'm not going to let you send me away this time. My legs wobbled as I carefully made my way inside the bar and summoned as much willpower as I could. It wasn't easy. My throat burned and my eyes were watering. The world rocked and swayed beneath me and I gripped my teeth against it. I pushed the bar door open and slowly made my way back to my stool. I motioned to the bartender and she returned to me. An eyebrow cocked. She told me she was surprised to see me back and I told her my car wasn't working. I told her a friend was coming to give me a lift. I was just coming back in to kill some time. I spaced out my words and tried my best not to slur. I asked her if she could load me a beer and a shot. She chewed her lip for a moment, and I could see her thinking. My intoxicated state apparent, no matter how good an actor I thought I was. I reached into my pocket and slid her two twenties, tipping her a wink. Eh, for taking such good care of me tonight, I said. The money shattered any moral disputes she'd been fighting against and immediately cracked the top of a beer. She filled a shot glass and placed it in front of me, telling me to behave myself. I thanked her and assured her that I would. When she turned away, I slammed the shot, gasping at a sudden charge of heat. Whatever edge I had lost from vomiting returned as the rum hit my system. I snatched the beer up and sucked it down, exhaling heavily as the last drop slid onto my tongue. I felt sick, like a soaked sponge, left on the counter. I stank, and my already upset stomach fought against the booze. I looked around, the room tilting and swaying, and saw there was only two other patrons. They were over in the corner, not paying attention, and to my delight, I saw them wave over the bartender. It looked like they knew her. She shot a quick look at me, and then went over to them. Heart racing, consciousness blinking, I quickly leaned forward and snatched a full bottle of rum from the counter. I chanced to look over my shoulder and saw that my act had gone unnoticed. You can't get rid of me, I mumbled, tipping the bottle to my lips. You can't make me stay here. I closed my eyes and drank. I didn't stop until everything went dark. I gasped and opened my eyes. I was on my stomach, soft clovers tickling my face. I breathed them in and sighed, relief running through me. I got to my knees, pulling myself up, and surveyed the meadow. But something was wrong. The sunlight was hidden behind thick gray clouds, a blanket of dark cotton. I craned my neck and was met with nothing but silent gloom. The woods were quiet. The usual chorus of birds and bugs eerily absent. I could hear my heart hammering in my chest. A rush of beating blood in my ears. I looked to my left, scanning the tree line, and suddenly felt sick as my eyes focused on the scene before me. A deep fear sparking in my chest. The forest was ripped in half, leaving a dark corridor of splintered ruin. It looked like an immense train had exploded through the woods, obliterating everything in its path. Fractured trees and uprooted underbrush spilled out to the clearing, the remains of nature's vicious goring. What's going on? I whispered, voice tainted with fear. I suddenly spotted something in the pond, floating on the surface. It bobbed slightly, and as I squinted to try to make out what it was, my eyes went wide and panic foamed in my throat. Now, now, charging over to the water's edge, I splashed into the shallows at full speed, tripping and then pulling myself up. I shoved the lily pads aside and sloshed deeper, the horror before me, gaining clarity. Russ! I screamed, reaching out for his motionless body. The water was up to my waist as I grabbed him, pulling him up from under. He was dead weight in my arms. His head was rolling against my chest as I dragged him ashore. Come on, come on, I begged gritting my teeth, heart racing, muscles groaning, his eyes were closed, and he didn't move. Gasping, I finally got us to the grass where we collapsed. A rush of weight and water. I struggled to regain my breath as I got to my knees and flipped Russ over on his back. My heart sank. 
His face was a mess of cuts and dark bruises. His, his clothes were a tangled jumble of torn fabric and tattered cloth. What happened to you? I cried, pushing strands of wet hair from his face. Who did this to you? I, I felt like I already knew the answer. I shifted myself over time, fighting panic. I placed my hands over his chest and began administrating CPR. Please wake up. Please wake up, I begged. Pumping his chest. Please, you have to wake up. Don't do this, please. I leaned down and blew into his mouth. Tears drank to leak from my eyes. I felt helpless, alone, filled with overwhelming despair. Why did everything always have to go to shit? Why did I always end up making things worse? Why couldn't I escape a never-ending stream of misfortune? Please! I screamed, now beating on Russ's chest. Please don't do this! Suddenly, in a rush of urgency, Russ's eyes snapped open. He vomited up a great gout of pond water. He coughed and sputtered, emptying his stomach as his body convulsed. I leaned back on my knees, unable to believe it. Relief swept over me as I exhaled. A cackle escaped my lips. Oh, you're alive. Oh my god, you're alive. I cried, gripping Russ's shoulder as he wept, as he wiped his mouth and lay on his back. Russ kept his eyes shut. His voice, terribly weak. Hi there, Slick. You just can't seem to stay awake. What happened to you? Why is everything different? I asked. Russ tenderly touched his beaten face before answering. My family. My family with you already gone. He didn't like that. Who? I already knew the answer. Boom. 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 I jerked my head to the woods. No, not now. No, no, please not now. Russ sighed, broken and defeated. I'm just coming back to finish the job. And if you're here, he's gonna get you too. Boom. 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 The drum is getting louder. I leaned down and grabbed Russ's arm. What does he want? Why is he doing this? Russ closed one eye and looked painfully at me with the other. He's not doing this, Jack. You are. My body went cold. I said nothing, my throat going dry. Suddenly, a long, rising whistle rose from the forest, first high, then dipping low. The notes bounced off the dark clouds and echoed across the meadow, filling me with dread. Russ tried to sit up, grasping at my arm. You can't keep doing this. He growled, desperation filling his voice. You can't keep coming here like this. He's gonna kill you. My eyes lined with tears and they spilled down my face. My limbs trembled and I looked down at Russ. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. I put my hands on my face, sobbing. Jesus, what have I done? Jackie! The voice cracked through the air like a clap of thunder. And my heart tripped into my ribcage. A flutter of crippling fear spreading across my chest. Another shrieking whistle. A sharp drill in my ears boring into my skull. The ground shook beneath my feet, and I suddenly heard a roar of exploding wood and crashing underbrush from the forest. The sound was distant, but approaching the meadow at a tremendous speed. The whistle, man. I whispered, my breath sour on my tongue. I stood up and faced the tree line. Sweat coated my face with cold fear, and I licked my lips, face pale and gaunt. I'm gonna get you. Russ said from the ground. Tears ran down my cheeks as the cacophony of sound rose around me in a deafening crescendo. I closed my eyes as the drum and constant whistle blasted around me. I could hear trees crashing to the earth as the whistling man rocketed towards me from the woods. I felt helpless and terrified, a lone man against a tsunami of power and devastation. The whistling man exploded from the tree line into the meadow. Immediately, was silent. My heart counted the seconds against my chest. I squeezed my eyelids shut even tighter. 
I suddenly felt the presence of someone standing directly in front of me, the hot breath on my face. I've been looking for you, Jackie. Something said, inches from my face. The voice was a low rumble, like thunder in the summer. I kept my eyes firmly shut. My knees were shaking and I felt my platter release in a rush of terror. My lips quivered and, and tears dripped down my chin. Go away, I croaked, my voice a dry rasp. I felt a heavy hand rest on my shoulder, followed by a low chuckle. <laughs> Go away. Nah, Jack. Why would you want that? You brought me here. I shook my head, squeezing my eyes shut even tighter. Not anymore. A hand gripped my chin. Look at me. Open your eyes. Look at what you created. Please. I sobbed. Spittle sprang. Just leave me alone. Open your eyes, Jackie. Weeping, I slowly pried my bloodshot eyes open, and the breath rushed from my lungs in a haunting wave of horror. I was staring into my own face. The whistling man grinned as the recognition twisted my face with shock. You see? He growled. There ain't nothing to be afraid of. This is just... Who you are? I took a step back, shake, tremble. No, no, this isn't who I am. He chuckled and took a step closer. <laughs> oh, yes, it is, Jack. I violently shook my head. No, no, I'm the, I'm the good person. I'm, I'm nothing like you. I'm nothing like you. The whistling man suddenly stepped forward and grabbed me by the throat, his grip deadly and impossibly strong. This time we finally settled this, Jackie. J just leave me alone. I gurgled as his grip tightened around my throat. He leaned into me, grinning and squeezing the darkness into my vision. It's over, Jack. Stars swam around me and the world began to fade. With one last gasp, I whispered. Please, just let me go home. Right as I was about to pass out, as blackness ate my eyes, the iron grip around my throat was removed. I gasped and fell to my knees, the meadow rushing back into focus, color and clarity realigned, and I coughed and sputtered, clutching my aching throat. I looked up in relieved confusion. My eyes went wide. Russ was holding the whistling man from behind. One arm wrapped around his throat in a chokehold. He his other arm over the whistling man's face, with his hand shoved inside his mouth, gripping his upper jaw with commanding strength. Sweat stood on Russ's face, his eyes two coals of burning fire, his voice cracked like a blazing furnace. He doesn't need you anymore! Leave him alone, goddammit! The whistling man growled around Russ's hand, fury shaking him. I am him. Russ's neck was strained as he began to pull the Wesley man's head backwards, howling with deafening authority. Not any more! Screaming with exhausted effort, Russ ripped the Wesley man's head back between his shoulder blades in an explosion of blood and bone. I heard a sickening pop as his spine shattered, blood gushing from his now lifeless mouth. Gasping, Russ pulled his bloody hand from the Wesley man's jaw and shoved the dead man to the ground. Breathing heavily, he looked at me, chest heaving. You okay, Slick? Shock rooted me to the ground, complete disbelief freezing me where I sat. Jack! Crying, I got to my feet to embrace him. Weeping into his chest, Russ stroked my hair and let me cry into him, his heart beating against my chest. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I'm so fucking sorry for doing this. Russ pulled me away and took me by the shoulders. You're a lot stronger than Jack. Never forget that. I wiped tears from my face, 
unable to stop more from coming. I won't forget. I promise I won't. Thank you. Russ nodded. You ready to go back? I nodded, sniffling. Russ closed his eyes. Good luck to you, Slate. I'm proud of you. And with that, he pushed me backwards, and I woke with a start on the bar floor. Faces were looking down at me, a blur of color and noise. I blinked, and, and everything rushed into focus. It was the bartender and two men she was talking to. Their faces were filled with concern, and I realized they were talking about me. Hey, you okay? One of the men asked, getting down on one knee and helping me set up. Relief washed over me in a suffocating wave, and I gripped my teeth as my eyes filled with tears. I smiled up at the three of them, my head clear and focused. All traces of the hangover were gone. I'm all right, thank you. I must have slipped in my stool and bumped my head is all. The bartender told me that they heard a crash and looked over to see me lying on the floor, unmoving. She said it had taken them a little bit to wake me up, almost to the point of calling an ambulance. I assured them I was okay, climbing to my feet and brushing myself off. My inexplicably calm demeanor clearly confused them to the point of not pressing me further. I thanked them for their concern and told them I was going to call a cab and go home. After making sure I was really okay, they told me to take care of myself. I smiled. I will. That was three years ago. It's been a long, hard road since that night, but I'm doing well. It took months for my wife to get over that horrific act of selfishness. But I've proven to her since I will never be that man again. I can't believe she didn't leave me, and it fills me with eternal gratitude. I spent this time proving to my family that they can rely on me. I've shown them my resolve, and we've grown closer. Making it through those horrible early months of uncertainty, but we're stronger now. Life has begun to show promise of happiness. I did end up losing my job, but my boss was able to secure me another with a sister company. It was an act of kindness I wasn't expecting. It furthered me down my path of positivity. It's taken three years to rebuild my life to the point of hesitant optimism. It's been three years since I had a drink. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that it was easy, because it wasn't. It was hard, imposs impossibly hard. Even after everything I went through, there were days I almost gave in to temptation, but I would open up to my wife during those times of weakness. She got me through them. She gave me hope that I could change. But I had to face what I'd become first. I will never go back to being that man. I'll find my own way to the meadow. I know it's out there, waiting for me. The path to its beautiful serenity, growing more clear the longer I walk the road of recovery. Even though I've come so far, made so much progress, I'm still filled with fear because I know he's out there waiting for me. He'll always be there. I'm the whistling man. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.